the smoke radio for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. I need your help to get to the year 1985. You're listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Good evening, Fade to Black. Yeah, man. Bespoke Radio for the masses. That's right. Today's Thursday, March 9th. 68 days into the new year. Just 297 days left. We are live from a bunker somewhere in downtown Burbank, California. And I would like to welcome everybody. Everybody listening all around the world, all across the United States. Hither and hither, to and fro, back and forth, up and down, east and west, north and south, far and near. This is Fade to Black. For KJCR, the Game Changer Network, and KGRA, the Planets. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. What is cracking, everybody? It's Thursday night, it's Fader night. I'm in the chair, as you can see. You can hear it. Because tonight we have a very special Fader night. It is the 20th anniversary of the Phoenix Lights. Tonight, Dr. Lynn Katai is joining the show. Going to hang out with all of you, take your phone calls. We're going to talk about the Phoenix Lights. 20 years. Pretty amazing, isn't it? Opening up the show for Dr. Lynn, of course, is John Rappaport and his No More Fake Newsroom Live. 323-825-5045 is the phone number. Follow us on Twitter at J Church Radio, Facebook, YouTube. Everything's faded black and Jimmy Church Radio. Simple enough. The sandbox is hashtag F2B on Twitter. The Twitter feed is up on the bunker cam. I think we have two of them there. I think we have hashtag F2BQ questions and hashtag F2B. The dancers are in full form. I hate mad. And uh, if you're watching me on the bunker cam, you can see the bunker cam is fast. I mean, it's pretty fast. I've been watching. It's, It's ahead of the radio feed. I've been watching how quick it is. So pretty much um it's a it's like spot on. I don't know how how we got lucky with the encoders and how we've got all of that set up, but it is fast. It's faster than audio. Go go figure, right? Okay. Uh email throughout the show tonight is Jimmy at Jimmy Church Radio dot com. Uh, Let me get a few things out of the way. We've got a packed show tonight, and uh, I wanted to just get straight to it. But you can subscribe to our podcast. We have over 600 archive shows there, custom apps, uh, Apple, Android. Everything is there. Just go to iTunes. You can go to the Google Store, look up Fade to Black, download the app. Then head over to our website and uh, subscribe to the podcast there. There's a podcast banner. Or... You can become a member. So we have a few different stages of things. Podcast is $2 a month. You can go to the membership area. Click on the membership area. Go down. You can become a fader not for free. Thursday nights, you get the bunker cam for free. All you got to do is sign up. All of that is free. Become a fader not for free. And then we have the bacon bar and, and the other categories going down. You can have commercial free archives of the show updated every single day. Uh, we are going to get to the older podcasts this week or the older shows this week and uh, aggressively get all of those uploaded. In the meantime, you have uh, 400 shows that are uploaded, all commercial free, 
right? It will take you years to go through the archives that we have up now. So don't sweat that. And then we'll have the rest of the uh, older stuff up over the next week or two. Um, all of the new shirts, uh, the hats and everything um, have started shipping. So if you've become a member, there you go. Those have started shipping. Thank you for that. Autographed hats, T-shirts, all that stuff. All right. So the membership area is there. So it's you know it's two dollars a month, ten dollars a month, whatever you guys want to do, and and discounts if you sign up for a year, right? It gets cheap. So there you go. Go and do it. Become a fade or not. Go to the membership area, or you can subscribe to the podcast. This month we will be giving away a Tascam DM100 Mark III digital recorder. Great for ghost hunting. Uh, for EVPs. If you're a musician, it's great for that. You're in college. You want to record your classes. It's great for that. You want to spy on your neighbor. It's great for that. It makes automatic backup files. It's got microphones built in. It's got two batteries. It's got a backup battery, too, as well. You're never going to run out of power. Totally professional. Compressors built in. It is it is the best digital recorder that you can get, all right? So we're going to give one of those away this month. All you have to do to get your name in the hat is subscribe for a yearly subscription. It's, it's that simple. And your name goes in the hat. We're going to give one away in about two weeks. We're going to do it live on the show. Draw a name out of the hat. Somebody's going to win it. Next month, we're going to give away a Studio Dome a stereo a package with two SB B2 speakers, hard shell case. We're going to give that away next month, and every month we'll have something really cool. All right? <sighs> Do check out all of our sponsors. Life Change Tea, GetTheTea.com, River Moon Coffee, Studio Dome speakers. All of the banners are over on our website. Every time I say, every time I say River Moon Coffee, something triggers Something triggers. I don't know what it is. I have to take a sip of that River Moon coffee. It is the best. Life change tea. I, I, I do this every single day. I do it all day long. I probably overdose on it, but I do my supplements every single day. Get the tea.com life change tea. All of the promo codes, everything that you need are on the banners over at jimmychurchradio.com. All right. Contact in the desert is coming up May 19th through the 22nd. Joshua Tree, California. Tickets and info over at jimmychurchradio.com. Every speaker that you've ever wanted to see or see again is there. All of the big names. Nori, Hancock, Valet, Baval, Shock, Wilcock, Good, Mars, Sukalos, Dolan, Collins, Linda Moulton Howe, LMH, Whitley, Streber, David Serrata, man, Mike Barra. Did I say Mike Barra? Mike Barra. Everybody is going to be there, and we are giving away passes. So the banner is right there at jimmychurchradio.com. Very easy. Go and click on the banner and enter. That's it. Just go to the website. Click. Enter the contest. You can't win unless you enter. Pass is non-transferable. If you enter and you win and you can't go, enjoy the victory, but then let us know so we can draw another name for somebody else that can get lucky and that has the ability to go to Contact in the Desert in Joshua Tree, California. With all of that, good luck to all of you fader knots. Let's get this show cracking. Happy birthday to 30 Seconds to Mars drummer Shannon Lido is 47. Yes, brother of Jared. Jared's pretty good. What what was Jared just in? He did he play the Joker? Is that I'm just trying to think. What do we just see him in? I think that was. Didn't he play the Joker in the new Batman or some twisted character? And uh, did a great job. Jared Leto's a uh, pretty cool, good singer too. Thirty seconds to Mars. Just Shannon Leto today, forty-seven. Our dead guy's birthday today is Yuri Gagarin, nineteen thirty-four to nineteen sixty-eight. Died at the age of thirty-four. Russian cosmonaut who became the world's first man in space in nineteen sixty-one. Spent a grand total of one hour and 48 minutes in the void above, allegedly. There are some, there's film. This is what's strange with Yuri. And the way that he died, too, was bizarre. But I'm not going to address that now. But there's the film that is shot of Yuri in the capsule, right? Well, that's a big film camera in his face. But when he's getting into the capsule, there's no camera there. There's no room for it. 
But yet he's up and they got, I don't know, man. I don't know if it ever happened. Could have, probably did. I don't know. I just feel weird. Yuri Gagarin, he was a hero. 1934, 1968, died at the age of 34. All right. On this day in history, OTD. Two years ago today, in 2015, today, we started syndication on the KGRA. It's been two years. It, that's a crazy thought, isn't it? Two years ago today. Also on this day in history, in 1997, Christopher Wallace, a.k.a. Biggie Smalls, a.k.a. the Notorious B.I.G., was shot to death at a stoplight right here in Los Angeles, California. Wilshire and La Cienega, Peterson Automotive Museum. There you go, on the stay in history. Fader fact. I did some vetting on this fact today, but I'm going to share this with you because it's disturbing. I talked about this last week. Venezuela. Venezuela had the fourth largest GDP per capita in the world in 1950. Number four, trailing only the United States, Switzerland, and New Zealand. By 1973, dropped to number 15. Today, it's not ranked in the top 50 in most lists. It's not there. Venezuela's gone. You can find... In a couple of funky listings, its highest ranking is about 36. Unbelievable. And that is a fader fact. All right, tonight is a very special fader night, the 20th anniversary of the Phoenix Lights. The uh, the time that has gone by, I, I just can't believe it. We'll talk with uh, Dr. Link Katai here in a few minutes. Um, I was in Phoenix. Uh, I've talked about this a lot. I was in Phoenix the entire week uh, before that, I arrived back in Los Angeles uh, that Friday evening uh, after the events that went down on March 13th, 1997, and that went down on Thursday night. Um, I didn't see it. I'm very disappointed, but nonetheless, it has been 20 years. Still one of the most incredible mass sightings in all history. And tonight, Dr. Lynn Katai is going to be here. We're going to talk about that 20 years. We're going to talk about how she is presenting uh, her events for the week. And uh, she's got uh, uh, two new books out. Um, and we're going to talk about all of that. Uh, uh, John Rappaport's going to be here in a few short minutes. All right. And then we're going to open up the phone lines, too, as well, because it's Thursday night. It's Fader Night, 323-825-5045. Well, I don't know if you guys saw this, but last week, Last Thursday, former President George W. W. Bush appeared on Jimmy Kimmel Live. And he was on the show to promote his new book, which is called Portraits of George. Yes, he's painting. Right? So that's his new book. So he's on the show to promote the book. But out of the gate, Kimmel tried to get Bush once again, uh, another, you know, ex-president, sitting president, whatever. To uh, to answer questions about UFOs. I don't know if you've seen it, but it did happen. Kimmel began the segment by asking Bush a question, um, at which he said this. This is, And I'm quoting here from, from Kimmel. He says, this is a question that's very important to me and very important to the country. You know, when you were in office, did you go through the secret files, the UFO documents? Because if I was president, that would be the first thing I did, right? Now, he he did this with Barack and Hillary and so forth. Um, and when he said that, Bush interrupted Kimmel with a maybe, right? Kimmel didn't even get the question done. And then Bush followed up with, you know, it's funny. My daughters asked the very same question. Then Kimmel came back with uh, if he would be allowed to tell his daughters, right, what he saw in those files. And Bush's reply was no. Now, we all know the questions and conversations are planned out way in advance. And I've talked, that, uh, talked about that a lot on this show. But in typo, typical uh, Kimmel fashion, he kept drilling. And he came back with, well, now that you're out of office, 
uh, you can do anything you want, right? Bush replied with, yeah, but I'm not telling you. And what was really cool was how he used the word nothing. Loved it. Kimmel said, you're not telling me what? Are you telling me that you, you know, that you looked at them? And Bush said, you know, I'm not telling you nothing. Well, check this out. I'm just going to do this for all of you. This is the full clip. I've quoted from it. Now, this is how it went down. We are back with President Bush. This is his book. It is called Portraits of Courage. And we will go through this and talk about some of the veterans that who you painted and you wrote about. But first, I want to ask you, this is a question that I think is very important to me and very important to the country. When you were in office, and I don't know when this happened or if it happened, did you go through the secret files, the UFO documents? <laughs> because if I was president, that'd be the first thing I did. You know, it's funny. My daughters asked the very same question. They did? Yeah. Would you be allowed to tell your daughters what was in those files? Uh, no. You would not? No. Now that you're out of office, you can do anything you want, right? True, yeah. Uh, but I'm not telling you. You're not telling me. <laughs> you're not telling me what? Are you not telling me that you looked at them? I'm not telling you nothing. <laughs> <laughs> are there really great secrets that you know that you can't share with people? Yeah. Yeah, there are. Uh, and you never write about them? No. Maybe at a time in your life that no. you're like, oh, I'm 90, I'm going to do it. No. No, nothing. What if, you, what if you were to get like a little like loopy, you know, you get old and... Start drinking you again? Start, yeah, yeah, start drinking again. <laughs> Guillermo, get some tequila. Yeah. <laughs> you want do you? So that's the whole clip. And that's how it went down. And what I find interesting is now between Kimmel and Ellen, we've now had Bill, Hillary, you know, Clinton, we've had Barack Obama, now we've got W, and all with the same answer, right? Or answers, noncommittal, and nobody has said no, right? Isn't that interesting? Again, I want to drive this home. I know that this is going to be analyzed just like all of the other appearances with, with Obama and Bill and Hillary have been. But but what's interesting here is the, the way that the questions are answered because these are done way in advance. Now, with Barack, you know they were way in advance. Hillary uh, was not in private life anymore when she appeared. And so a fact... I think she was almost in the campaign, right? You know, Bill's out of office. He can pretty much do what he wants to do, just like W, which was brought up here. But the same sort of answers happen. Nobody said no. Nobody said no. There's no UFO files. No, there's no alien contact. No, no, no. And certainly the way that W answered this, and I thought he was pretty candid and and pretty funny, but... It was the same sort of vibe. So now we're up to number four. Um, What do you think eventually uh, is going to happen with Trump? You know, because you know that Kimmel's going to have him on the show. And you know that the first questions are going to be about UFOs. Will it be the same? I don't know. We have to wait and see. But that was pretty telling. Um, Lee Spiegel of the Huffington Post has uh, written a good article about it, and I uh, put up the links both on Facebook and over on Twitter earlier today, so you can go and check those out. I would like to get uh, Lee on the show here uh, pretty quickly to get his comments on this too as well. Lee has, uh, you know, he's presented at the United Nations. He has been involved in in ufology since the early 70s, and he's been following politics, and of course he is a journalist and a writer for Huffington Post, and I think his insights on this are uh, something we need to hear. So I'm going to go ahead and arrange that. I reached out to Lee, but my point is very simple. These questions are done in advance, and they know that they're coming, and the answers are planned, and the answers have been evasive. Pretty interesting. Now, I do want to uh, make a comment here. Last night, Marla Martinson brought up, our guest last night, Marla Martinson, brought up the star that has been appearing uh, over the last year at the west end of the valley, right? 
behind me, up upstairs, ground level, and then back because I'm facing east. So back behind me, uh, above ground and, and back. That is, And it's been there, right, oh, for the last year. And it's been like just right above the horizon. I was talking about that last night. You know, so when you turn around, you're looking at the west end of the valley. You know, it's like, you know, it's like right there above the treetops kind of thing. Well, and it doesn't appear, the star doesn't appear to move with the stars. Well, tonight, just before the show, uh, left the bunker, went up, went out to take some pictures because I wanted to post them tonight so I could show everybody what we're talking about. It wasn't there. It was like, what? It wasn't there. I went out, got my camera. I'm ready to take some shots. And it wasn't there. So I took a before shot, by the way. Uh, You know, this is what I thought, which is what it's been doing over the last year. It's going to appear like, you know, like it has been. Okay, no big deal. So I take the before shot, pop, right? And I wait. And I wait, and I waited some more for the first time, for the first time. It's not there. I, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what to think. Now I've always thought that it may be a satellite and that it was being positioned each night. That's what I thought. No big deal. Right. They're positioning is of course there's satellites all over the place that are being moved around different times of the day, whatever. It's what they do, right? And that that satellite was picking up the reflection of the sun, and it was at a weird angle, and that's what was reflecting back because it does kind of look like a, uh, you know, a flashlight or something, a, a headlight. You know, it's bright coming back. But uh, it's not there. So, which, again, I want to stress this. It's... Not that big of a deal, right? Or is it? Because it makes me think of the obvious. Could the man have been listening last night to the show, right? Listen to all the phone calls that came in because, you know, we took three or four phone calls last night with with listeners, you know, from around the country too, New York, Ohio, uh, right here in, in California. Yeah, dude, I've seen it, man. I've seen it. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, it's right. And... Could their cover have been blown? So tonight they didn't position it. Now, look, man, I don't want to go all tinfoil hat crazy, but this thing has been up there every single night for the last year. Stars don't disappear, do they? Right? I don't know. Do they? Pretty strange. I mean, when was the last time you went outside and you looked up and the moon wasn't there, but it was there the night before, right? It's kind of like that. It's been there every single night. I've been pointing it out to Rita. We've sat and watched it for hours, talking about it, wondering what it was. Tonight, poof, gone. I've been out, you know, back at our house, cooking on the grill, yeah, the cooking and and at six o'clock in the evening, and look and 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 it's there, right? Sat there at the table in the dark and looking at the star. Everything else moved, but this one star is 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 been there every single night, just right there. On the, it's gone, gone. The only thing that I have right now is I've got one beautiful image that was taken at about six o'clock at night. Before the show, nice sunsetting blue sky with nothing in it, blank. So I stood there and I stood and I waited. I waited, waited a half an hour. I waited 30 minutes. Nothing showed up. It has been there every single night. I feel like a dog that's waiting for his owner to come home. You know, every single night, 530, the car pulls up, dogs waiting like clockwork every night. Well, tonight, no star. And I don't know quite what to make of it. Um, During one of the breaks, if I have the time, I'll see if I can uh, get back up and out of here and outside to see if it's there. I I don't know what to say. Um, If somebody is uh, listening here in Los Angeles right now to the show, and we open up the phone lines uh, a little bit later on with uh, uh, Lynn Katai, call call me and let me know what's going on up, up top side. And let me know if that star is there. I don't know what to make of it. Um, the, 
The funny thing is, so I called Rappaport. Uh, he's going to be here in a couple of minutes. I called Rappaport. I said, John, this is at 6.30 an hour ago. I said, John, the strangest thing has just happened. And I tell him about Marla last night, and I tell him about the star and, and how we've been, and that and now I'm out here, and for the first night in a year, it's not here. It, do stars just disappear? I mean, is that possible? On the night after we mentioned it, God, it's just weird. It causes my brain to go into places that I don't like, man. I don't like thinking this stuff. It's just too strange. All right, I'm going to get out of here. Let me get John Rappaport in. And uh, I have no idea what he's going to talk about tonight. When I called up John and told him about this star, and I was like, dude, dude. And we talked about that, and I hung up. And I forgot to ask John what he was going to talk about. So I don't know what's about to happen with the No More Fake News room. So let's sit and enjoy the cool tones of John Rappaport together, and let's get our education on. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Network and KGRA. The planet. I'll be right back. You're listening to Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. Fade to Black will now pause for alien identification. The station that talks the net. KGRA Radio. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of Fade to Black... You create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the Fade to Black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of Fade to Black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights. Just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. Go back, Lee Tepe. Hi, folks. In a world of GMO, genetically modified organisms, that is, chemicals, processed foods, and a healthcare system that's unraveling like a cheap suit, it's time to prepare. God created herbs, and herbs help man. Our body can heal itself, just sometimes we need assistance. You need some help? GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. Our mild detox is quite powerful with its unique blend of eight different herbs. And if you're looking for more, our non-GMO supplements will help you with different needs you might have. Health should be a top priority. Take care of your health naturally. Log on to GetTheTea.com. Dot com. That's get the tea dot com. Give your body a treat. Let the herbs do their thing naturally. Read all the testimonies on the website. Get the tea dot com. That's get the tea dot com. Sickness and viruses are like intruders and herbs are like warriors. Let the tea work for you. That's get the tea dot com. Nine out of ten geneticists agree. Fade to black is not your father's radio show on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the planet. Hi, this is Chase Klutzke with Fate Magazine Radio, and you're listening to Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network and the KGRA digital broadcast station, where the Fade or Nots rock. Hi, this is Rob Reiner from Anvil, and you're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. What's up? I'm Chris. What up? This Mass is Kyle Bass, and you're listening to Jimmy Church Radio. And now, coming to you. 
from the no more fake newsroom in deep space, which is the space that we suspect to be true. That the world as it is fed to us every single day by the ministry of truth is a lie, a false reality, a movie projected on the screen of our subconscious. This, however, is the breakout. All the screens crash. They all go down and we see the light of day, a new day. No more robots, no more androids. It's the No More Fake Newsroom with John Rappaport. Take it away, John. Thank you, Jimmy. Hello, everybody. Great to be here. Before I jump in tonight on this most unusual report, I just want to put out my thanks to Jimmy, Rita, the crew, everybody, the audience, all of you, for this uh, space in which I can present reports on issues that very few others are reporting on. In some cases, no others. It's been uh, quite fantastic and it continues to be fantastic and I appreciate the opportunity, believe me. So with that, I want to take you on a medical detective story tonight. You're going to need to screw in your brains real tight on this one and follow this step by step. There'll be a lot of questions that pop up along the way. Many questions. And this was prompted by my going back and reading my own book, AIDS Inc., Scandal of the Century, which I wrote in 1987-88. And uh, this time around, I found a quote from a molecular biologist that I was interviewing in the book. And he made a very basic point. And this is the first thing you have to grasp. When researchers are saying that a virus causes a specific disease, they need to establish that in human beings, not in a petri dish in a lab or some form of speculation, but actually in live humans, that there is a whole lot of that virus. I've said this before, but why? Why is that essential? Why can't there just be a few little tiny viruses? Because, you see, and this is a basic fact, cells in the body reproduce. They reproduce often and many, many and often. Now, if you only have a few viruses infecting a few cells, the rate of reproduction of that type of cell, whatever it is, is going to be outdistancing overwhelmingly these just one, two, three, four, five viruses. It's just not going to cause disease. Whether or not these little few viruses are present or not, they're not going to add up to disease. You've got to show that there's a huge avalanche of these viruses that are outdistancing the ability of that type of cell that they're infecting to reproduce in a natural way. Okay, so that's step one as we move through the maze here. Okay, now step two, and before I give you this, I want to say that I've rearranged certain time sequences here in medical research and analysis in order to give you a, a different look, a different picture here. Okay, number two, step two. You are conventional medical researchers and you have a test that can detect the presence of a virus in a human being but this test, at its best, can only establish the presence, not the numbers, not the amount of virus that's present in a human being. In fact, that's why the test exists. It's called the PCR, the polymerase chain reaction test. 
you take a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of material that you wouldn't be able to observe under uh, lab conditions, and you assume and hope, think it's a fragment of a virus, and you amplify it. You blow it up time after time. You keep blowing it up and making bigger, 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 bigger. Like in the old days, you take a photo and keep enlarging it to a huge size. And that will enable you to observe and hopefully determine what kind of virus this is. But why did you have to do the test? Because you had no other means of detecting the possible presence of a virus because there was such a tiny amount of it in the body. Therefore, that test is not really any good for determining whether or not this virus is going to cause disease in humans because there isn't enough of it. There just isn't enough of it. You have another test. And this test has traditionally been used in medicine to indicate that the body contacted a germ of some kind of virus, let's say, and successfully warded it off because of the action of the immune system. But that isn't going to help you as a conventional researcher expand the amount of diseases in the world, which is kind of your prime directive, especially if you're associated with pharmaceutical companies, because this test is geared for the most part to indicate that people have successfully through their natural immune systems defeated the virus. So now what are you going to do? Now we come to step three. You're going to take these two tests and twist the meaning of what they show and don't show to accommodate what you want to be able to do. You're going to take this PCR test and you're going to claim that, oh yes, we can count the number of viruses and we can see that there are many, 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 which is not really true. That is not part of the test, but you're going to say that it is. And the second test, which is really the antibody test that I described, you're going to turn that around upside down, backwards, inside out, and say all of a sudden that if people test positive on that test, which used to mean that they defeated the virus, now we're going to take that as a sign of infection with the virus, meaning disease. Science, who cares? We're going to turn these tests inside out backwards in order to promote the idea that more disease is occurring. With me so far? Stay with me here because it gets much more deep as we go through the maze. The next step is, and this is a description the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, and I've mentioned this before, has a branch called the Epidemic Intelligence Service, which I call the medical CIA. These are doctors who have been trained. This program is very old. Several thousand doctors have been trained as virus hunters. And at the beck and the call of the CDC, they can be awakened in the middle of the night, they pack a bag, they're off to some situation somewhere in the world that the CDC wants investigated. But you see the bias of these trained doctors and professionals is toward the discovery that whatever the situation or the problem, the health problem is, it's going to be a virus because that's what they're looking for. Another way of multiplying disease and also promoting the idea of epidemics, ah yes, which we have seen certainly a number of them over the last uh, 15, 20 years. So there again, you see, you've got a disease promoting operation here that is going to expand the number of diseases and epidemics because 
the bias and the predilection predilection is to find a virus and blame whatever the health situation is for example suppose it's an outbreak caused by pesticides or it's an outbreak on a giant factory farm uh, where there are pigs and there's all kinds of contamination and uh, decaying matter and swamps and you know hideous things happening on these factory farms that are causing workers to get ill the bias is going to be again to find uh, the bi the bias of the research is going to be to find a virus okay let's take an example for example SARS which was at its height in 2003 now what happened in that case there was an outbreak supposedly of a flu-like illness uh, in China researchers went in there and all of a sudden out of nowhere 10 World Health Organization labs were set up to discover the cause of this outbreak these labs were connected by closed circuit television communication no outsiders permitted and in a very short time, they came up with something they called a coronavirus, which they uh, touted as something they had never seen before, a new virus that was at the root of all of this. Well, on this basis, the World Health Organization started declaring emergencies and so forth, and this was going to be a pandemic, and it could sweep through the world and kill millions of people, and you know, the, the usual, right? But then a curious thing happened in Canada, which was one of the centers of the, quote, SARS outbreak. A microbiologist named Frank Plummer, who worked for the World Health Organization wandered off the reservation and gave an interview to the press. And he said, you know, it's a very curious thing, but as the weeks pass, these people who have SARS, their tests, their blood tests are showing no coronavirus. More and more of these people until now, we seem to be reaching a point where almost zero percent of these SARS patients actually have the coronavirus. Well, that's a contradiction because the virus hunters have said we found the cause. It's the coronavirus that causes SARS. If you now say you've got all these SARS patients, and they are SARS patients, but they don't have the virus, you can't say they have the disease. This was quickly covered over. There were no more interviews to be conducted and the media just shut the whole story down and the World Health Organization just moved right along as if this never happened. That's what's called a clue, folks, a major clue that something was very, very wrong. And let's go back to a story that I've told several times on this show before, and I'll give you the very short version now. 2009, swine flu, another so-called pandemic in which everybody was uh, urged and pressed to get the vaccine. In the late summer, early fall of 2009, Cheryl Atkinson, who was an investigative reporter for CBS, discovered a staggering fact. The CDC, Centers for Disease Control, which had been counting cases, that's what they do, of swine flu, and we're talking about at the time maybe 10,000 cases in America, and there are going to be many more and so forth. The CDC had stopped counting cases of swine flu, and they didn't tell anybody that they stopped. That's their job. Why did they stop? Atkinson further investigated and discovered something amazing, that almost none of the patients, the most likely swine flu patients, 
who had their blood tests sent to labs for diagnosis were coming back with any trace of swine flu or any other kind of flu. That's why the CDC stopped counting. They were in a panic and they really didn't know what to do. They just shut up. Meanwhile, the press and the government and so on kept on rolling with promoting how terrible this whole thing was, swine flu, et cetera, et cetera. It was a total hoax. A total hoax. Many, 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 many of these diagnosed or most likely swine flu patients had blood tests. And the blood tests were sent to state labs all over the country. And they were all coming back negative. No trace of swine flu or any other kind of flu. And then, about three weeks after Atkinson's story appeared on the CBS News website, the CDC estimated, and this was printed in the press, and I have the citation, I published it, <clears throat> they estimated that, in fact, there were 22 million cases of swine flu in America. A preposterous lie. The CBS Evening News said they would not take <clears throat> the Atkinson story and run with it. It was not going to happen. And that was the end of that story. Let's take something else. Ebola. We all know about Ebola. Where I'm hearing something on my end here, other voices speaking. Shut that down. Can you shut that down? I'm getting interference here. Okay. All right. Ebola, we all know the dire predictions, millions and millions of people are going to die, and of course it didn't happen. What happened? What was going on? I decided to investigate on a very simple premise that had to do with my experience in researching swine flu and SARS. And my question was, has the Ebola virus, again, I'm getting interference on my end here. I don't know who's doing it or what's happening. I'm just going to, sounds like a news report is coming in here. We're getting interference. Okay. I don't know what's going on. Jimmy, are you there? I'm here. I'm here. Okay. I'm getting interference on my end. I'm hearing a news report from some station. Wow. Okay, I don't know yep. what it is. Can you hear it on your end? Nope. Okay, well, I'm going to keep on going then. That's bizarre. I'll just, talk, I'll just talk through it. Okay. So my question was, uh, maybe somebody is hacking in and trying to disturb this uh, report. Anyway. Wow. My question was, has anybody ever really isolated the Ebola virus from a human being? Has it ever really been identified? Now, to many people, that seemed like a crazy question. But again, based on my research with swine flu and SARS, I thought it would be an important question. And I contacted a scientist, and I've written about this. And uh, we went back and forth on this. And uh, I was satisfied that he had the ability and the credentials. And I said, would you do a literature search? and see whether you can find a proper isolation of the Ebola virus that was made from any human being. Isolation means you remove tissue, you analyze it, you test it, you do certain things with it, a number of things, and you say, aha, here it is. Yes, this is the Ebola virus. This is a virus we have not seen before. We're going to call it Ebola and we can identify it, and here we find it in this one, and that person, this person, that person, et cetera, et cetera. And he came back to me, I think about a month later, and he said, I've done a literature search. 
and I can find no convincing evidence that this virus has ever been isolated from a human being. Zero evidence. The last <clears throat> step here through the maze of this detective story, and I would only recommend to you that you use a search engine to come up with this, is an interview that was done a number of years ago. And the title of the interview is, Does HIV Exist? It was done by a freelance reporter, an excellent reporter named Christine Johnson, and she interviewed a scientist from Australia, a member of the so-called Perth group, and this group had done a great deal of research on this question. And the answer to Christine's basic question was, there is no evidence that HIV has ever been proven to exist. And if you read through the interview carefully, it's chapter and verse on what would be, should be the procedure for proving that HIV exists. What are the steps that should be taken? And then were those steps taken by the leaders of the research effort in the 1980s that resulted in the announcement that HIV causes AIDS, such as Robert Gallo, for example, at the National Institutes of Health in the U.S. And through the course of the interview, you can see, and Christine does an excellent job of staying on track in the interview and reviewing each step in the procedure that should be done. And the indication is that one or two crucial steps, very crucial steps, were not done. And therefore, there could be no conclusion from this research effort, which was the research effort, that HIV exists. There would be no proof, convincing proof, that it exists. There are the clues, folks. They're all laid out. I've got them numbered as nine steps here in what I've taken you through in the last 20, 25 minutes or so. It is more than intriguing, more than fascinating, and it opens the door to the entire method of operation, shall we say, of those researchers who establish what is a disease, what causes the disease, have we proved what causes the disease? This is at the root of disease research in the medical community. This is what I've given you here in these nine steps. I can assure you very few reporters or investigators have put together as a series of steps or clues that not just a starting point, but as a study, you might say, of the incredible hoaxifying operation that is at the root of everything that we are told about, oh, the disease is coming, oh, the disease went away, oh, here's a new one, it's coming, oh, this is a disease we know all about. All of that, the root of it is contained in what I've discussed in these nine steps. And so if you've taken some notes or if you catch the broadcast in the archive and you want to do your own investigation and move further into this, I think it would be an excellent, excellent idea. And you would discover Mind-boggling, it doesn't even do it. Mind-boggling doesn't even do it. And I'll conclude with this. 
I developed a method of investigation when I wrote my book, AIDS Inc., that started with this. Let's take the risk groups, so-called, as listed by the CDC, the, the groups at high risk for AIDS. Gay men, intravenous drug users, hemophiliacs, Haitians, etc., etc., etc. There are about six or seven. And let's see if all of the symptoms and situational problems, health problems of these groups that are being called AIDS could be explained by other factors which would not be the same from group to group, but in each case would account for everything that's being called AIDS without having to invoke a virus at all as the cause. And my conclusion back in 1988 was, yes, indeedy, you could do that. You could do that. And that was my starting point. And the book went a lot further than that, investigating HIV and so forth. But that has stood me in good stead all the way to now and will in the future. And that also becomes part and parcel of what I'm talking about here. Because using the virus as the explanation or what I would call the cover story, you can explain away a tremendous amount of activity such as predatory uh, corporate activity that does in fact produce a disease all over the world all the time. Pesticides, medical drugs, vaccines, etc., 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 by invoking, oh, we know what the cause of all that is. It has nothing to do with any of that. It's a virus. And that's my report for tonight. Thank you for your attention. John, 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 trippy that some interfere because there was nothing here on this end. Nothing at all. You said yeah, that? Yeah, that's amazing. It happened like three or four different times. Wow. And the report from Japan is and so-and-so, and it was quite loud. Otherwise, I just would have ignored it. But it just <laughs> came, you know, lancing in from outer space like yeah. somebody had tuned up my headphone to yeah, start that, listening that, to the news. That's bizarre. And and it stopped after you mentioned it? Or did it continue? When I talked to you and you said you weren't hearing it, and I said, I'm just going to keep on plowing. It, it stopped. It, it, stepped, it kept on going for maybe five seconds, and then it cut off and never came See, back. Somebody's listening. And now I told the audience about me calling you tonight to tell you about the star that was missing in the sky, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, I feel like, and I think it's cool, they're listening. So, you know what? Screw it. it I, you know what? That just means we're winning. That's all that it means, John. We matter. Yep. Never forget that, ever. Thank you so much for everything that you do, my friend. Thank you, Jimmy. Really appreciate it. You're the absolute very best. I'm going to roll with this Japanese news report. I'll talk to you soon. <laughs> John Rappaport, everybody. Thank you so much, John. No more fake news.com. That's where you should start off your day every single day. This is Fade to Black, 20th anniversary of the Phoenix Lights with Dr. Lynn Katai coming up next. Stay with us. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network. And KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. The station that talks the net. KGRA Radio. Hello, I'm Kat Healy, and you're listening to my main man, Jimmy Church, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Hi, this is Ray Sobs here, repping the planet, and you're listening to my good friend, Jimmy Church. Fade to black on the Game Changer Network and the KGRA Digital Broadcast Station. This is Toby Kebble. You're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. Don't hurt me, Jimmy. I'm only little. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And this is Ari Gold. We're of the Honey Brothers. Well, the... <laughs> yes. We are of the Honey Brothers. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And I'm Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. And you're listening to Jimmy Church. The Revolution. What's up, Fader Knots? Studio Dumb loves Fade to Black and the F2B audience so much that they have put together the ultimate stereo Bluetooth system. They've done it just for you. 
man. Check this out. The Studio Dome SBB2 stereo system is here. It's featuring two Studio Boombox 2 SBB2 wireless Bluetooth speakers packed in its own custom hard shell case. This Studio Dome system features the very latest in stereo Bluetooth technology. The two full range boom boxes are in true wireless stereo. You've got to hear this, it's amazing. It's just 129 bucks and use the promo code JCRTWS and you'll also get free shipping. It's simple, just go to jimmychurchradio.com, click on the Studio Dome banner, go back Lee Tepe. Balance of Nature's Fruits and Veggies. I was diagnosed with congestive heart failure. I went from being able to work 14, 16 hours a day with no problem to where I could barely walk a block to the store. I went on to the phytonutrients about six months ago, and within a couple of months, my medical doctor had cut my prescriptions down in a, a little bit smaller dosage. The next time I went back a month later, I walked into the doctor's office, and he says, my gosh, what's happened to you? You don't even look like the same person. He looked at my legs and the swelling had gone down. My blood pressure was down. The venous stasis ulcers that I had had on my legs for the last four or five years because of the poor circulation were all healed, and I'm feeling far better. The new challenge will allow you to receive two months of Balance of Nature's fruits and veggies free, and we'll even ship them to you free. Call now for details. Call 1-800-2468-751 or go online to balanceofnature.com. Use promo code TALK. This is Micah Hanks of the Graylian Report, and you're listening to Jimmy Church on Fade to Black, across the globe on the Game Changer Radio Network and the one and only KGRA Radio, The Planet. Man, I, you know, <clears throat> I'm just going to do this because if I have to go to another commercial break, I'm going to do it now. Our guest tonight, Dr. Lynn Katai, 20th anniversary of the Phoenix Lights. She was here, and now I'm not so sure. So I'm just going to go, Dr. No, Lynn. I'm here. Oh, you're you there? there. You're there. Oh, okay. Oh, so, I'm, I'm okay. waiting for you. <laughs> hey, we've it, it, it's been weirdness tonight. I'm going to get to that in a second. So uh, let me do the proper introduction. I, I, I cannot in, have you on my show without a proper introduction. Lynn Katai, MD, is an internationally acclaimed physician and health educator who pushed aside her successful medical career to pursue the Phoenix Lights book, internationally award-winning documentary, and all other pro, uh, projects. She was leading the cutting-edge area of early disease detection and prevention as a chief clinical consultant at the world-renowned Arizona Heart Institute's Imaging Prevention Wellness Center in Phoenix, Arizona until coming forward after seven years of staying underground as a key witness to the still unexplained mass events and sightings of March 13, 1997. But one of my favorite things about Dr. Lynn, and only one person in the world can say this, and it's her, she played the role of Florence, Arizona in the Coen Brothers film Raising Arizona, starring, of course, Nicolas Cage, Holly Hunter, Francis McDormand, and John Goodman. Today, she continues to tour the United States and abroad, introducing screenings of not only the award-winning Phoenix Lights documentary, but presentations for her best-selling book, The Phoenix Lights, A Skeptic's Discovery That We Are Not Alone. Her website, of course, is thephoenixlights.net, and I would like to welcome back to Fade to Black, our good friend, Dr. Lynn Katai. Okay, Dr. Lynn, good evening. Oh, good evening to you, Jimmy. And I and I have to just interject. Uh, you mentioned Raising Arizona, which ironically is celebrating its 30th anniversary right. um, next month. And what's, what's really, I don't believe in coincidence anymore, and anybody that reads my book will, will understand why, because there were so many serendipities that, that happened uh, not only after the, the Phoenix Lights mass sighting, <clears throat> excuse me, but, but uh, ironically enough, not only did I play the part of Florence, Arizona, but someone came up to me a couple years ago uh, during a, after a talk and, and said, you know, there's a reference to your character 
in Raising Arizona and UFOs, which I didn't remember because it was released in 87. Right. And I hadn't even watched it since the 80s. And I take a look, and if anybody's seen it out there, um, there's one, uh, it's a black comedy uh, that uh, Holly Hunter and, and uh, Nicolas Cage uh, cannot conceive, and they figure they'll just kidnap one of the quintuplets of the Arizona family. And uh, after that, after they do take Nathan uh, Jr., there's a press conference in front of our home, and one of the reporters sticks a microphone in my husband's face and says, there's a rumor that your son was abducted by UFOs. Is there any truth to that? And my husband says, please, please, son, don't print that. If his mama reads that, she'll lose all hope, which is pretty ironic because not, not only was it 10 years before the mass sighting, but my take on it is very different, as you know, Jimmy. And, and what's funny is um, I had heard the same thing. So uh, Rita and I, uh, I was probably about a year ago, watched the film again. And you just said if anybody hasn't seen it, the entire known universe has seen Raising Arizona. Make, make no mistake about that. But we went back and went, sure enough, it's right there in the press conference. It's a, a hilarious uh, reference. And, and knowing what we know now today, and certainly you and that being in the movie, it is, uh, what you know, it's beyond coincidence. So It's bizarre. And they even make it more bizarre, Jimmy, the cinematographer who went on to do the movie Big and, and When Harry Met Sally and The Addams Family and, and is really a, a huge uh, director and, and cinematographer, also created and directed the Men in Black series, which opened, the first one opened, in 1997, the same year as the mass sighting. No, oh. that's Barry Sonnenfeld. Yeah, that's, that's you can't right. Can't tell me that that's not a coincidence. He was the DP on Raising Arizona. Yeah, that's right. Mm. Yeah, a lot of people don't know that that's where Sonnenfeld got his start. They just yeah. automatically just put him in, you know, the great director category. But you're absolutely right. He was a cinematographer, the DP of uh, Raising Arizona. Was he a geek? On set, I um, mean, was he? He was actually such a nice guy, and we we had such a good time uh, filming. And and oh boy, could I tell you some stories? <laughs> but <laughs> it was great. Imagine. It was really fun. The Coen Brothers, of course, the whole cast, and most of the cast was just starting out then too. Nicholas Cage had just started doing some films, and the others uh, really. The, it was the, some of uh, Holly Hunter and John Goodman and Francis McDormand. Uh, they were just getting started, so a lot has happened. In the last 30 years. So we're celebrating the 30th anniversary of Raising Arizona while we're celebrating the 20th anniversary of what's become the most historic, most witnessed, and most important uh, and documented mass sighting in modern history. Now, it's the 20th anniversary. I, I cannot believe of the Phoenix Lights and, and, and what happened that night. I, I cannot believe 20 years has passed because I look back... I've told the story many times. I've told this, you know, my experience uh, in Phoenix uh, with you, it, which is, it's one of my big disappointments, right? Uh, life's been pretty good to me, but I missed, I was in Phoenix and I got back that Friday night from Burbank Airport, walked in, threw my luggage on the ground, turned on the TV, uh, which must have been about 10 o'clock at night or whatever, because the news was on. And there it was, you know, last night in Phoenix, a massive UFO sighting. And I'm watching the news. I, I, I just landed from Phoenix. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. I missed this. And I was watching it on TV. Obviously, we all know now how big and how. I was at the Hard Rock Cafe outside on the patio that night. And I didn't bother to look up. And how how crazy is that? I mean, but there there you go. I got back on Friday. It happened on Thursday, twenty years ago. It's unbelievable. It is. It is. And, and I've had more people say to me, "Oh, I wish I would have seen it." Um, and and still today, today, I mean, there is not a week that goes by that I don't get an email or a message on Facebook. And and please, I welcome people to take a look at not only the website, which is packed. The Phoenix Lights dot net, uh, Phoenix Lights Network website, which is packed with information to explore and consider, but also uh, Facebook Phoenix, Phoenix Lights Network Facebook page, and even today I got the most incredible report from someone who was 16 when he saw it, 
and he ju- he didn't even and this happened to many people by the way um he, it just was was buried in his subconscious until years later he saw something on television about it and he, it just opened up a floodgate and in fact if anybody's interested go to the share page we just posted it this afternoon his story and it's so detailed i mean the way it affected people we can get into that tonight if we can that it's really besides the nuts and bolts of the mass sighting which is important to note as well how it affected people in real time and long term is really poignant and important so i hope we can get into that but anybody out there that doesn't know about the phoenix lights and mass sighting the arizona 1997 march 13th uh... sighting while thousands of people and this is another little coincidence while thousands of people were outside purposely on a beautiful spring night looking up at the sky very clear sky at the hale Bob Comet. They also caught a glimpse of these mile to two mile, and, and, and we have had reports, in fact, uh, I just did a, a big uh, weekend about the Phoenix Lights in Oregon, and one of the speakers was uh, the head of the uh, National UFO Reporting Center, Peter Davenport, and he was talking about some of his reports, and he got hundreds and hundreds of uh, thousands of reports, um, was eight miles wide, which was like, what? <laughs> right, <laughs> I mean, that right, right. really blew me away. But anyway, we're talking about either these orbs, these balls of light in total equidistant shape, V or delta, triangle or boomerang shape, traversing the entire state, and there's so much missing disinformation out there. That was one of the reasons I came forward after seven years of anonymity was to set the record straight, because it wasn't one or two events, as you would hear in the media. It was many events, starting actually weeks before, which we can get into, because I actually documented not only two years before, up close and personal, right outside our bedroom window, three orbs in a pyramid formation, which... I caught on 35 millimeter uh, film and didn't know even who to show it to because I had no interest or knowledge in the topic at the time and wondered for two years what this advanced technology was outside our bedroom window. And then, lo and behold, two months before the mass sighting, the lights appeared again but at a distance. And I felt compelled, I guess, as a scientist to document them on film. And actually, if you, if you go to the photo page on the phoenixlights.net website, and you'll see not only the topography, which is very interesting, because from our vantage point in the mountains in Paradise Valley, we overlook the, the valley and uh, have a panoramic view. So anything that pops up out there, and we were very familiar with street lights and car lights and, and plane lights and so forth coming in and out of the airport, which we see. But just south of that um, is South Mountain, and then a little further are the Australia Mountain Ranges. Um, and there's a little interesting story that I can just interject here, if I may, um, talk about a coincidence. Six months before the mass sighting, I was asked to present my substance abuse prevention education program. I formed a company in 85 uh, after doing health reporting and community education for, for many years um, to get uh, video and workbook curriculums into the classroom and uh, health education learning programs and are now distributed AIDS and teen pregnancy and substance abuse by Discovery Education. At any rate, I was invited to present the substance abuse program at the Gila Bend Indian Reservation. And this is part of the story, too. They live in the basin in between South Mountain and the Estrella Mountain Ranges. Anyway, after the mass sighting, I started seeing that these phenomena kept popping up in that area. So I called them up and I said, did anybody happen to see strange lights on March 13th? And they started to giggle. And I said, is that funny? And they said, are you kidding? We've been looking up at them for centuries. We call them sky people, light beings. It's part of their culture. I had no idea. Right. I mean, that was the first I had heard of it. But two months before the mass sighting, I actually captured the same exact mile-wide phenomena that I would also capture on video during the mass sighting head-on turning into a V. So if you go to the photo page, you'll see the topography with the mountain ranges and the uh, Gila Gila, uh, Native Americans said to me that's how they got the name, Estrella. It means star in Spanish because of the vast history about these phenomena. And not only that, they believe there's a gateway or portal in that area. And that's why I bring this up, because if you do go to the photo page, you'll see that consistently, at least from my vantage point, 
these anomalous aerial phenomena keep popping up right in that area where South Mountain and the Estrays intersect, and they have very sacred ground there, and they've been seeing them for centuries. So that's one little little aside. But anyway, well, let me I'm, let me jump in ahead. really quick, if you don't sure. mind. Um, where you are at, are you like at like Lincoln and 30th, 32nd? Are you in that part? Down near the, the Biltmore area. Yeah, the Biltmore area. Okay, so right. um, in, in those mountains. Now, what I want everybody to understand where uh, Dr. Lynn's house is, from there you are overlooking the entire city of Phoenix. It lays out in front of you. Uh, the airport basically is in the, in the center of of that mass. Uh, right. You have downtown would be to your right, looking out over the city, and then to the left of where your house is is Scottsdale. Right? That's basically Correct. the layout. I'm looking at it right now. Yeah, yeah. You <laughs> yes. can tell I've never been to Phoenix, Doctor Lynn. <laughs> but um, and, and but you got it. You got it right on. Yeah, yeah that's, that's and so. and so you can see everything from where you are at. Well, whatever pops up out there, we we usually it catches our eye because one wall of our bedroom is a window, and that's why it was just so unnerving um, when we had to close sighting because it was right. Literally and figuratively outside our bedroom window. Well, everybody um, lives on that hill, too. Alice Cooper lives there. Do you ever see Alice running around? Well, actually, it's funny you should bring up his name because uh, he came to one of our screenings. And by the way, anybody that's listening that's in the Phoenix area, this Sunday we're going to be celebrating the 20th anniversary. We're really getting off the track, but we're celebrating the 20th anniversary uh, with, a, with a huge event on Sunday at the Scottsdale Hark and Shea Theater. Um, and uh, we've been doing it for the last, since I came forward in 2004, and then I produced a documentary in 2005, our internationally award-winning documentary, which we screen, and we have uh, guests afterwards. We're having the councilwoman vice mayor, uh, Frances Barwood, who we can get into that. She was the only elected official that asked for innocently for an investigation. She was plastered by the media. You know, there was so much ridicule at the time. And uh, also uh, um, Arizona uh, Navajo Rangers, who are law enforcement, who are studying these things. There's a lot going on in the Navajo Range. In fact, they had uh, a mass sighting on in their little community um, the day before ours. They thought that would be big news of these right, orbs right. that were going around in circles, and they're so used to it. They bring out their lawn chairs, and they watched it for an hour. And we also have a top physicist and uh, UFO expert from China. He doesn't speak a word of English. He met me last year to see my data and was blown away and showed me pictures of the same exact thing, and his son lives here now, and he's going to be translating for him. He's going to show us pictures from China. So there, there is so much going on on Sunday. So anybody that's, that's in the neighborhood, um, I hope you'll join us. It's been sold out the last 12 years, so I recommend getting your tickets early at the Scottsdale Hark and Shea Theater, and the information is on the Phoenix Lights uh, website and uh, Facebook page. But at any rate, getting back to um, the two months before the mass sighting, uh, I caught the same exact mile-wide phenomenon. This is really important data. Um, if you really look at the data, it speaks for itself, head-on, turning into a V-shape. It was so unnerving that the next day, I figured there must be a logical explanation, I called around, finally found air traffic controllers at Sky Harbor International Airport, and this is really important data, that saw the same thing at the same time over Class B restricted airspace. There's a 30-mile radius around the airport. Anyone that comes into that airspace, particularly a 1,000 feet altitude that these were, must call into the tower. And no one didn't. These were five miles away. And there were pilots calling in and asking what the heck's going on. And all this, they looked on radar, didn't show up on radar. They took their binoculars to look, and in their own words, they described this as six points of light totally equidistant from each other, massive span, over a mile wide, that seemed to be attached to something or had a force field holding them in rock-solid formation. And you will hear this again over and over by thousands of people two months later right. during the mass sighting. And one of them was a meteorologist and said that the, the whole thing turned against the wind as a unit and then elevated slowly and moved behind South Mountain which is just south of the airport. So I said, so what were they? 
And there was silence. And then one of the air traffic controllers said, beats me. I said, you're air traffic controllers. You're supposed to know what's in our airspace, and you didn't know what they were. They ruled out every logical and, and conventional possibility, including flares and helicopters and even skydivers with, with lights. Um, they had no clue what they were, and we kept in contact. I continued photographing them, and there were other people seeing them, too, by the way, for days before, up until and including March 13th. And again, getting back to that, when thousands of people are outside looking up at the sky, here they see either these orbs that seem to be attached to something or actual craft. And this is another important thing, Jimmy, that people should know. There were 10 different craft. Now, a 12-year study from thousands of reports from the National UFO Reporting Center in Seattle, Washington, Arizona MUFON, Mutual UFO Network, then former uh, Vice Mayor Councilwoman Frances Barwood, who received over 1,000 calls, as well as Village Labs, which was a computer uh, lab here that was a clearinghouse for most of the reports, two or more people had to see the same craft. And if you go on the Phoenix Lights Network, uh, website and go to the GAP page, G-A-P, Geospatial Animation Project, you're going to see the 10 different crafts. Now, whether it was one craft that could morph into looking differently right. um, or, <clears throat> or from the perspective from where the person was standing or an actual parade, and that's where the data comes in because there were many things happening at the same time in different areas, not only throughout Arizona, starting at 3 p.m. in the afternoon, and seen in New Mexico in the 5 o'clock hour, in California in the 7 o'clock hour, and over Las Vegas, there, was a, there were two commercial air, airlines, we get into it in, the, in my book, that actually saw one of these craft hovering, just, just covering Las Vegas. And that's a story in itself, if we can get to it. And then at 3 a.m. the next morning, and this continued, by the way, until 5.30 the next morning, when a Boeing crew, and I talked to a fellow who was one of the crewmen, were coming into the uh, airport for work at 5.30 the next morning, and one of these crafts was hovering right over their tarmac. Also, there was a call at 3 a.m. in the afternoon, and we have to talk about the technology a little bit, but at 3 a.m. in the afternoon, in the next morning, there was a call, a recorded, very professional call. We have part of that in the documentary as well to the National UFO Reporting Center by an alleged crewman from Luke Air Force Base who reported in great detail that one of these craft, and there were civilians that saw this, by the way, was hovering right over 7th Avenue and Indian School, Central Phoenix. And military jets from Luke were sent off to intercept and get gun camera film. We did hear they did get gun camera film. And as they got close, the lights started to dim, and then it totally disappeared and blinked out. And that was and at 7th yeah. and Indian School, you said? At 7th Avenue and Indian School. That's that right downtown. That that's right downtown. That's mm -hmm. next to uh, the basketball arena. Yeah, that's that's pretty much downtown. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, yeah, this crewman said that he had to help one of the pilots out of his aircraft because he was so shaken up by it. So, right, so they right. were well aware that there were things going on. And actually, that we have a 911 police operator in the documentary who came up to me um, a, a few years ago uh, after a talk and said, I heard that the police said that they didn't get many calls. I said, well, that's what they say. And she says, well, I'm here to tell you I just retired. And if you want to hear the true story, we got hundreds of calls. And she's wonderful in the documentary. So, mm -hmm. yes, and they had yes. helicopters up as well. People ask me about that. Why didn't they do anything. Well, they were trying. They were they the military and police were well aware that there were things happening. And uh, you know, I have to say, when you're talking about again going back to the technology, these craft were so massive and rooftop level. There were people that said they could have thrown a rock at it. It was so close. Right, right. Going about thirty miles an hour, just gliding totally silent. Totally now uh, we're gonna wait, head wait, to, wait, well, wait, no we're gonna hit we're gonna hit a break here break? yeah we got to do a break so I don't want to let's this is a good spot to take a break actually so uh, but I wanted to ask you this the, the, the out of all of the sightings the one uh large uh one the first that went all the way down you know following basically the 10 freeway down to Tucson and then uh, apparently was also seen in Sonora, Mexico, 
right? Right. And so this mm-hmm. this wasn't just localized over Camelback Mountain. Oh, no. No. People you know, saw it in New Mexico, in Nevada, and California. And what they saw also were these orbs detaching from right. some of the crafts going out into the environment, as as well as these crafts just taking off and, and blink speed. Some of them separated in two and shot up at, uh, straight up without even dispersing the air. I mean, the technology itself, which, by the way, Jimmy, we haven't seen in 20 years, okay? Right, <laughs> it's just right. just awesome. It, it, you know, and again, I, I need to stress my disappointment in this. You know, you know what I do. I know what you, you know. This is, mm-hmm. this is my life, right? Uh. And I was right there, and and to this oh, I day, I mean, to this day, you know. So from here on out, you know, I mean, every day, I, that's all I do is look at the sky, right? Well, <laughs> and, I always say, keep keep looking up, but you're doing you're doing a big service by sharing the information. So that that's a good thing. There was one other um, incident right after the Phoenix Lights. Um, I was up at a friend of mine's house on Camelback Mountain. And uh, we were talking about the Phoenix Lights. This was about two weeks later. And I had Timothy Good's book, Above Top Secret. Mm-hmm. And in mm-hmm. there, there's a, a story about uh, um, right around the corner, right there in, in Paradise Valley, a massive uh, craft that had come down and landed uh, right there off of Scottsdale Road. And, you know, we had the ad, and, and it, it, it had since been paved over. But that was another incident that other people don't really talk about. You have to get into Timothy Good's book to see it. But again, another story right there in Phoenix. Um, there's something going on. And uh, I, not only the Indians, but Luke Air Force Base, they are well aware of what has been going on over in the skies of Phoenix. Absolutely, absolutely. There's a lot more to this story. I know. Let's let's pick it up. Let's pick it up right there when we come back. This is Fade to Black, 20th anniversary of the Phoenix Lights. Our guest tonight, the one and only Dr. Lynn Katai. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. This is Fade to Black. More with Dr. Lynn right after this short break. Stay with us. Here, we listen to Jimmy Church. You're listening to Fade to Black. Always on the edge of the hottest alternative talk, Jimmy Church with Fade to Black. KGRARadio.com. ¿Qué tal, mis amigos? Yo soy Mario Carcanel, tiburón, y los invito para que escuchen a mi buen amigo Jimmy Church Radio. Claro que sí. Hey there, quick question for you. Would you be okay with more energy, more endurance, thicker, healthier hair, a better mood, reduced appearance of wrinkles, improved sleep, improved blood pressure and cholesterol profiles, improved vision, improved memory? Okay then. Well now, have you heard of Nature's Youth RSF? It's from the anti-aging experts at naturesyouth.com. Naturesyouth.com. See, at Nature's Youth, they understand exactly what it means to provide top quality health products. And Nature's Youth customers not only improve their health, they know they're also providing their body with the right nourishment to maintain that peak performance and fight the aging process. If health, wellness, and nutrition are what you desire, choose Nature's Youth RSF. I did. You see, you're going to get older. It's just up to you how you feel when you get there. Get started today. Nature's Youth RSF. Simple to use, simple to order. Go to naturesyouth.com. That's naturesyouth.com. Naturesyouth.com. I was introduced to this remarkable product, Balance of Nature Fruits and Veggies, and to say it's amazing is an understatement. Balance of Nature provides the nutrients of 9 to 11 servings of 31 different whole ripened fruits and veggies per day, and the cost to the consumer for 9 to 11 servings is about 22 cents per serving, as opposed to over a dollar in the store. Balance of Nature Fruits and Veggies helps boost the immune system by over 720%, and they also provide a health coach for you at no charge. 
to guide you with any questions you may have. And you can also visit their website for testimonials on balanceofnature.com. So take steps to give yourself better overall health and call them now, toll free at 800-246-8751. That's 800-246-8751 or go to balanceofnature.com right now. Make sure to let them know you heard it here by using promo code TALK for a special discount. That's balanceofnature.com and use promo code TALK. You are listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Oi, oi, I'm Reese Evans. You're listening to Jimmy Church. This is Revolution. The Revolution will not be televised. The Revolution is on radio. Ciao. Fade to Black, 20th anniversary of the Phoenix Lights. Where did the time go? Our guest tonight, Dr. Lynn Katai. And Dr. Lynn, before the break, we were starting to set things up. And you had mentioned, uh, and I want to pick up where we left off, that there were up to 10 distinct sightings that night, or 10 craft. 10 different craft. 10 10 different craft, besides orb formations. I mean, there was so much going on. It was really a parade. Whoever did this wanted to be seen. And I want to get to how the story unfolded, which is really intriguing in and of itself. But I also wanted to mention, since you brought up the 10 craft, um, just this week uh, came out with a coloring book and graphic novel that uh, is just stupendous. I have to tell you, it is so fun and for all ages. And in there, it's actually called The Phoenix Lights, UFOs, and Crop Circles Coloring Book Graphic Novel Adventure of Sue F.O. Field Observer and Hugh, H-U-G-H, Hugh F.O. And he's a little alien. And we have an incredible illustrator and uh, people that, that, that joined as a team, and that's, it really takes teamwork to do this, um, to make such an amazing, amazing 150-page black and white, 160-page with color graphic novel, uh, which is now on Amazon.com if anybody wants to take a peek. But we also take them through the, uh, it starts out with the Phoenix Lights Mass sighting and gets into the history of UFOs as well as a 10 different crafts, and we have them there for people to draw and exactly where they were seen at the time from all the studies from the 12-year uh, study that was done, uh, as well as crop circles. Uh, we have over 80 crop circles, uh, wonderful crop circles that seem to be the, of the authentic kind, um, as well as uh, games and puzzles. It is an amazing, amazing book. I hope people will pick it up and enjoy it and enjoy it with their family. Um, it's something to do other than the, uh, the computer. And uh, anyway, we have the 10 different craft in there as well. Well, as, don't you have, the, uh, uh, since we're talking about that uh, really quick, isn't there a special price tonight, too, um, yes, on Amazon? Well, actually, actually, um, at, because of the 20th anniversary, we wanted to do something really special and update the book, which is in its third print now. The last uh, edition was in 2010. And just today, um, we released the Kindle version, uh, which is amazing because now we have colored pictures uh, in the Kindle version as well as links that people and I, and I really sprinkled a load of amazing links throughout the book uh, so people can really check things out, whatever the topic is that we're delving into. And uh, uh, it's offered for nine ninety nine. They didn't want to do that, but I said, you know what, uh, I really want to give a gift to, to anyone that's interested out there, particularly uh, the Jimmy Church Show, um, to, to be able to, to take a look at the, at the data because it's fascinating. It was 100, well, actually, after the mass sighting, 
uh, I pushed my whole medical career aside for seven years and stayed anonymous. I did not want to come forward, but I also wanted to find out what the heck I saw up close and personal. And uh, once I started looking for a logical explanation, I started finding such credible data that just blew me away. I mean, the, the history of these phenomena from the beginning of human documentation and the, and the Sumerian writings and even the Bible is at the Eel's Wheel, and right. we have frescoes and paintings in the um, 15th and 16th centuries, and even, uh, you know, if you fast forward to uh, uh, the, the end of, the, you know, the 1800s, 18, actually it's almost 100 years before the mass sighting, 1897, um, what was described in Kansas and Washington and even Canada uh, was these massive airships with removable lights, which is very interesting because that's what people described during the mass lighting in 97, or these lights detaching from the main object and going in on the environment and then redocking with it later. This was six years before the Wright brothers took flight, okay? And then World War II, and I'm really fast-forwarding here, um, we, we have the Foo Fighters, what they called Foo Fighters, the same phenomena, these orbs, that each side thought was a spy technology, and it wasn't until after the war when everybody tried to find out who had the spy technology, Japan and Germany and the United States, that nobody could, okay? So they've been around a long time. In fact, in our documentary uh, bonus features, we have a 93-year-young, he just passed this past year, um, French pilot who saw these Foo Fighters and reported it, and he's been he was communicating with these phenomena, um, and whoever was was driving these things for for decades, uh, and his story is really interesting. It's in the the bonus features, but anyway, and and then we of course know that in the 90s, 80s, and 90s we have Hudson Valley and the, and UK flap and and um, Belgium, which is a model for what should happen because they join forces with. Uh, you know, the civilians and scientists and university and military to get to the bottom of it. That's what really should happen. And many countries out there are much more open to these phenomena, including China. Now, I wanted to ask you, yeah, I wanted to ask you really quick. I don't know if we've uh, talked directly about this, but I have, and Rita and I, uh, you know, we have seen orbs, right? I've Mm -hmm. seen some crazy things that I can't explain. And you have certainly done that and, and photographed it. How, how does that change you? I know how it's changed me, but how has it changed you? Lynn? (laughs) That's a whole, that's a whole discussion. I do want to get into how the story unfolded, but that's a very good question because, um, number one, number one, and I, this is really important. There has not been one report, not one of harm, threat, or abduction associated with the Phoenix Lights anomalous phenomena. Can't speak for other things, but right. I can for the Phoenix Lights. And these are appearing worldwide, and they've been appearing since human documentation began. Okay? Right, right. And when you're talking about these orbs, the native cultures, um, many of them believe that these are spirit world coming to give, or other intelligences, coming to give us um, knowledge and comfort and inspiration. And I have to say, Jimmy, I've certainly been inspired to do what I'm doing. I would have never chosen to do this, but it, it's just something that, that needs to be done. And, you know, when you have the data, uh, and I'm the only one with 35 millimeter uh, film, in good conscience, I just couldn't stick it in a drawer, and I squeezed that 750-page journal into the 240 pages of the best information, and the new book that's just coming out now is, uh, it's evolving, it's evolving. But anyway, getting back to your question, what's really interesting is how the phenomena affected people in real time and in long term. In real time, six months before the mass sighting, the movie Independence Day was really popular. Right. And we are so inundated, and we talk about this in the documentary, with threat, 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 and harm, 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 and the media and Hollywood. That Sir Gary Schwartz, who's the head of the Consciousness Study Department at the University of Arizona, makes a very poignant statement in the documentary when he said, if you're, you know, initiated with, with all this threat and, and uh, frightening scenario, how do you think you're going to react when you see something that's strange, right? Right, right. right. Well, well, kids who were usually the first ones to see this massive mile to two mile wide V coming towards them were jumping up and down, Independence Day, Independence Day. But as the phenomena got closer, a calmness 
came over everyone. In fact, this guy that just wrote, just sent me the email today, talked about that. It's very interesting. A calmness came over everyone, a connectiveness to the phenomena that after it passed, they wanted to chase after it or have their parents get in the car and, and, and follow right. it. It's really interesting to see in real time and then long term. I have to tell you, Jimmy, I mean, it changed people forever. I mean, not, not only... You know, people say, do you believe in UFOs? It's not, a, it's not a belief. It's a knowing. These people have experienced something that was so beyond our re- reality cube that they know in their heart of hearts. And, and it really touched people at a very, very deep level. In fact, there were a number of witnesses who had had near-death experiences as children that was reawakened by the mass sighting. And I found that really intriguing because I did too. And in my book, I lay it all out there because when, once I realized, my goodness, you know, could there possibly be a connection between all unexplained phenomena, whether it's near-death experience, out-of-body experience, unexplained aerial phenomena that has a mystical light associated with the experience? And lo and behold, again, when I started looking, I started finding such credible studies being done at university level, the Omega Project by Dr. Kenneth Ring at University of Connecticut, and then Dr. Stuart Twemblo and Dr. Um, Bruce Grayson, and, and, and even uh, at Harvard, um, Dr. John Mack and so forth, were all finding a connection, not only in the experience itself, and I lay it out very simply in the book, which is really, really intriguing in and of itself, but whatever the unexplained phenomena experience is, but the after effect. It's so positive, the awakening, the enlightenment, the, uh, the knowing that well, someone I, feels connected, that I start calling all unexplained phenomena, UP, and up. Right, <laughs> right, up. right. Well, what about, let me ask you something direct here. You, you're a doctor, right? And research and, and, and uh, disease discovery and pre-discovery and so forth. That, that was your career. What? does the metal your friends you know your doctor buddies that you hang out with what do they think do, you know okay here comes dr lynn everybody just behave she's the phoenix lights you know or are they cool with it and do they do they talk to you about it that's a really good question i had gone to, back to work at the arizona heart institute as a chief clinical consultant of the wellness and imaging center the heart test right and um which i loved it was a fabulous a uh, fabulous job, and um, no one knew that, you know, on the side, I was editing down the 750-page journal, and I did not want to come forward, Jimmy. I mean, I really didn't. I tried to, to get the book out there um, anonymously, but, of course, no publisher wanted it, and I didn't want it to sit on a, on a shelf, and I, and I, you know, in all honesty, I mean, I did the homework for me. <laughs> I wanted to find out what the heck was going on. And I thought, how can I stick this in a drawer in good conscience as a scientist, as an educator, right. as an experiencer, and also as a physician? Because even though most anomalies can be explained, only a small percentage cannot. Just because we don't have the technology yet, it doesn't mean they're not real. We may just be looking on the AM dial for an FM frequency. And when someone has a paranormal experience, it's real to them. And if they don't talk about it, right. it festers and it's not healthy. And I really wanted people to know that it's important to share, even if it's just with me, it's just like this gentleman did today, you know, sending me an email um, or on Facebook. It's important to share. It's cathartic and it's healing. So that's part of the mix, too. So anyway, when I came forward... And, you know, I have to tell you, I really tried to do my homework. And in the book, I have conversations with military and with witnesses and with experts. And I went to extreme lengths to have my 35-millimeter photographs, which are uh, a plenty, um, analyzed by university and military optical physicists. And across the board, no one could give me an answer to what they were. And I figured, look, it is what it is. I'm just going to get the data out there and... People can decide for themselves. Everybody comes from a different background, from a different upbringing, from a different belief system, worldview. Some people can't deal with this topic. Some people don't want to, and that's okay. And that's what okay. about everyone in their own time? I have to ask you about Fife. 
right? <laughs> Five, oh, well, I'm going I'm to tell you how the story unfolded because it's really interesting before we get ahead of ourselves. But anyway, yeah. just, to answer your, just to answer your question real quick, when I did come forward, I couldn't believe the positive response from everyone. They really appreciated the work that went into it. So, and they're okay um, with it. They're okay. Which, which, oh, yeah. Well, they knew I wouldn't. And that's the other thing, too. In the early 80s, I, I, had, I had started doing health tips uh, while I was in medical school, actually, uh, in Philadelphia at the NBC affiliate with Jessica Savage, if you remember um, the name. She was a, a big uh, news person there, and she was kind of my mentor doing health tips. And the syndication grew from that. And when we moved to Phoenix in 1980, they were already showing the syndication at the CBS station. And then I started doing health uh, reporting at NBC here. And by the mid 80s was seeing kids in the practice that were drowning in substance abuse. But what was interesting, the people that I worked with in the early 80s at NBC here, when I came forward in 2004, now were the head of the news department at Fox and the the production at at, at, uh, ABC. And they were like, well, the, the Village Labs called the person who had the pictures Dr. X. Okay. Right. So when I came forward, it was like, you're Dr. X? Oh, my <laughs> goodness, come on over. And they have been so kind and so supportive to this day. I mean, I, I just did four interviews today you know, for all the stations that are going to air this weekend. But at uh, but any rate, it, they, they knew that I would not have come forward if I didn't do my homework and I didn't think this was real. And so it's been, you know, I've been very blessed that, that people have actually taken this seriously, as I have. And that's why I came forward, because it's enough. I mean, it's, uh, it's enough with the snickering and the ridicule and the, and the uh, discrediting. Something's going on here that needs to be addressed and accepted and studied so we can find out who's driving these things and also find out, you know, move forward in our own evolution. Um, so anyway, I've been, I've been very blessed with, uh, with the response, and I hope that it continues. <laughs> Okay. Uh, Thursday night is our normal open lines call in night, and I've uh, been ignoring calls. Uh, I'm going to open up the phone lines. Everybody would love to say hello to you and ask you some questions. Well, so, I'd, I'd love it too, but can I, can I skip, but, take five minutes to just say how the story unfolded? Because you asked about Symington. Yes, quick? yes. It, well, okay. uh, everybody, Fife Symington was uh, not only the governor. But uh, was a witness, and he came out and at a press conference and kind of pissed everybody off. And, and it turned out he was an actual witness, and then he had to come clean. Are you and Fife cool today? Are you? Well, actually, actually, we've never spoken, which is interesting because I did try to contact him. But you know, if you look at the story, and and I'll go through this really quickly, although there's <laughs> a lot more to the story. But what was what was really bizarre is that after the mass study, I mean, we're having 10,000, over 10,000 people, and, I, and it is over 10,000 people, that saw this right over their heads. We have pilots in the documentary who were right underneath the lights and looking into these wells, these giant wells or canisters, they would describe, of, of lights, and yet there was no investigation, no explanation for months. Suddenly, in, in June 18th, okay, there was a front page USA Today article that came out that opened the sighting to international scrutiny. Before then, very few people knew about it outside of Arizona. And we were deluged by media from all over the world. And once they started talking to the witnesses, their descriptions were so detailed and so heartfelt that they too were saying, why isn't there an investigation? Why isn't there an explanation? And the very next day, on June 19th, We get an announcement in the morning that then former Governor Fife Symington was calling a press conference for that afternoon to reveal the culprit of the lights over Phoenix. And he comes marching out, one of his uh, aides with a giant alien head costume and making a mockery of it. And, then, you know, people were really offended. I have to tell you. I was. Yes, yes. It was not yes, cool. I mean, especially parents with children. I mean, the, you know, what do you say to them when they're making He's making a joke out of it. And I called every military base. I have many of the conversations in the book, which are quite comical. They were just as curious as we were of what was going on. A month later, I get a call from the head, one of the heads of PR at the Air National Guard. And she says, oh, Dr. Lynn, I think we know what those lights were back in. March, and this was July 20, uh, July 24th, 
I said, great, I was looking for any logical explanation. She says, do you believe in all these months nobody ever looked at the log for visiting Air National Guard, and the Maryland Air National Guard was in town sending off military flares in Operation Snowbird, which, by the way, in military terms means diversionary tactical maneuvers, which has been a diversion ever since. And, by the way, nobody in 20 years described what flares do that saw the true unknowns. But anyway, she says, that must be what some people saw. So I said, well, wait a minute. Um, were they here in January? She says, oh, no. I said, are you sure? She said, absolutely not. I said, well, <laughs> I, you know, I have 35-millimeter photographs of the same exact phenomena in the same exact location two months before the mass sighting, confirmed the next morning after the, the January and the mass sighting um, as hovering over Class B restricted airspace by air traffic controllers. And she says, you never told me that. And then I said, besides, you're trying to tell me that flares that cannot keep a formation, that drift and drop haphazardly with the wind, have huge smoke trails that are illuminated by the flare itself and illuminate the area around it, which, by the way, not one person described, traverse the entire state in a rock-solid, equidistantly spaced, mile-wide right. V for hours. And she says, uh, I have a call coming in. Uh, I'll get back to you. Well, of course. I'm still waiting. Right. 20 years later. <laughs> uh, let's grab a quick call before the break. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. Say hi to Dr. Lynn Katai. You're live. Hello. Yeah, you're live right now. Three, two, one. You know, somebody's been on hold for, you know, a half oh. an hour. And I'm sorry. Well, no, I catch him by surprise. I'll, I'll, I'll keep the phone lines open. 323-825-5045. Um, uh, well, with, anyway, that, do you want me to continue with how the story unfolded? Okay. I think, well, I got this caller back. I <laughs> just want to do this before the break. Hi, okay. you're live on Fade to Black. Hi, hi, Jimmy. Yes. This is Earl from Long Beach. Hi, Earl from Long Beach. How are you? I'm doing great. Uh, the reason why I'm calling is in reference to the light you were referring to over L.A. tonight. Yes. And you say you couldn't uh, you couldn't find it. I saw it. Oh, you did see and it. And I did see it, and for the first time, and I even brought my wife out and my son out, and they got really creeped out about it and told me to uh, stop looking at it. Did you, did and you I get a my, picture? I took, yeah, I took my iPad, and I took a picture of it. And when I zoomed in on it, it was really weird. It was spinning at a high rate of speed and turning colors like red, uh, yellow, and white. And it was just sitting there and just spinning, spinning, spinning really fast. And then when I came back to, to listen to you and then went back out there and you said you didn't find it, I went back out there. It was gone. See, okay, Earl, but, do me a favor. Send me those pictures, Okay. Um, and, and thank you for that. Uh, Lynn probably doesn't know what we're talking about right now, but, um, <laughs> okay. but that's it, okay. Because by the way, a lot of people would describe, and some looked at through a Celestron telescope and described the Phoenix lights the same way. Well, see, uh, Lynn, check this out over the last year, Earl, stay right there. Okay. Over sure. the last year. Um, uh, our guest last night, Marla Martinson brought up, she lives here in the Valley. She brings up this bright star-like thing that has been in the western sky uh, above the horizon, and it's been there for the last year. It just shows up. It doesn't move with the stars, and it's like looking at a headlight, and it just hangs in the sky. Well, anyway, over the last year, I've been talking about this with my wife, Rita. We've looked at it. We've sat around and watched this thing, and it doesn't move. And it shows up right around dusk and just hangs out there all night. Really, like looking at a a, a headlight on a car. It's like really, really bright. Well, That's so right. Yep. And and so she brings it up last night. I start talking to her about it. I'm blown away. I was glad that somebody else has been witnessing it. So tonight before the show. I go out. It's been out there every single night. I go out tonight to photograph it. It's not there. Right? I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. It's been there every single night. So I came in uh, uh, down into the bunker and started the show and said, look, I went out to photograph it, and it, it wasn't there. I've got a shot of the sky, but there's nothing in the picture. Earl is calling in now to yeah. tell us that he has seen it. I, I do want to see this picture, Earl. So you've got my email address, jimmy at jimmychurchradio.com. 
Very simple. And by the way, the, the best way to, to photograph these phenomena is 35 millimeter or infrared if you have that handy. This spinning, this spinning thing is really cool. Um, mm. Yeah, Earl, send it to me. I want to see it. And I'm just glad that you saw it. But it is, it's a phenomenon. And I don't know why uh, nobody is talking about it. And I was so glad. I know, it was really weird. Yeah. And what's your email again? Jimmy at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Very simple. All right, thank you. All right, Earl. I'll have a great you night. Down. You got it. Thank, thank you. you so much. Um, Keep looking up. <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you, Lynn, this thing no, it's is exciting nuts. When you see something out of the ordinary and, and you really can't put it into, like I said, our reality box, um, even though it might be explainable, uh, it is interesting and you want to know what it is. Well, and it's been out <laughs> I there know every that sing- feeling well. I, exactly. You know, and it's been out there every single night. And so I go cool. and mention it on the show. And and then I thought that it might have been a satellite they were positioning every night. No harm, no foul. I get that. You've got satellites that are being moved around all the time. And, and maybe the sun is reflecting off of it in a weird way. I mentioned it on the show last night. Tonight, it's not there. Coincidence? <laughs> I don't know. It feels a little strange. It's hiding. Yeah. It's hiding. So, hey, do you want me to get into more of, of yeah, the we've history, got, or you want to take a break? No, we've got uh, three minutes. Okay, good. Um, anyway, uh, after they came out with the flare thing, um, it was really, uh, you know, it was like, what? <laughs> I mean, how did they come up with that? And then in retrospect, the only hard evidence, because people ask me all the time, why didn't more people take pictures? Well, in 97... The clunky cell phones were just coming out, and they didn't have uh, cameras in them, so who carries around a camera, right? But I had one in the corner of my bedroom because I had been seeing these things, and there were a couple other people who had cameras uh, that actually caught, either either they tried to take the um, craft, the picture of the craft, but it was so black and blocked out the stars that the pictures didn't turn out, or they were a little bit of a distance like we were and actually got, the orbs in a you know formation, the same formation. That's the thing when you really look at the data, the same exact formations that people were describing for hours before and after the triangle or V, which I call it you know, over class B restricted airspace, the three endpoints of a V or triangle, um, a delta shape, which was also caught before 10 o'clock, and then after 10 o'clock, there were a couple of videos that showed this huge boomerang. And that really came under fire for being flares. Um, and I have to say that has been, by the way, last year, very interestingly, even though if you look at it, it's like spectacular. They stay in rock-solid formation. But someone with high-tech equipment actually analyzed that video last year, Thinker Thunker is the website, and showed unequivocally that those lights do not budge. They are not like flares at all. Even though in in video they're much smaller, the lights are much smaller and they flicker and um, they're white. Uh, In real life they're huge and amber color. Um, But nonetheless, the formation, if you really look at the uh, the video, you can see they're, they're not moving at all. For a length of time, so that kind of, that that really um, not only ruled that out, but three years. This is interesting. Three years after the mass sighting, our former uh, vice mayor was running for secretary of state on a platform to get answers for the Phoenix lights, and she was asking for a reenactment. And lo and behold, we get an announcement, public announcement, that three Air National Guards were coming into town on March the 8th to reenact the Phoenix Lights. Well, if you go to our news page on the Phoenix Lights Network website and scroll down to the Arizona Family CNN uh, affiliate uh, report, you will see how they failed. They tried to make a triangle. It was upside down. It fell apart immediately. had used smoke trails, just what flares do to date. The Phoenix Lights have never been reenacted or explained, and the craft have never been addressed, never been addressed. And then right after the 10th anniversary, as you mentioned earlier, our former governor, who had mocked the sighting in 97, came forward for whatever reason and bravely disclosed that he actually saw one of these craft. And as a military and pilot, they definitely were not flares. And in his own words, they were otherworldly. Let's take a break right here. It's the 20th anniversary of the Phoenix Lights. Our guest tonight, Dr. Lynn D. Katai, 
MD. I am your host, Jimmy Church. This is Fade to Black. Follow me on Twitter at JChurchRadio on the Game Changer Network and KGRA, The Planet. I'll be right back. Hi, everybody. This is Rob Halford, the Metal God, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. KGRA Radio. Intelligent Talk. Do you know what's in your body soap? Well, I didn't know the answer until about five years ago when I looked at the label of my soap and was shocked to see all the chemicals. For my entire life, I had been assaulting the largest organ of my body, my skin, and to think my children were using it too. Well, a lot has changed since then. Today, my family and I operate Stone City Farms, where we make and sell all natural goat milk soap using fresh goat milk from goats we raise on our farm. Our mission at Stone City Farm is to produce high quality, all natural goat milk soap for people who want a fresh, unrefined natural product. At Stone City Farms, we offer scented and unscented soaps and a signature line of gift sets customizable to your needs. To see what our customers are saying, go to stonecityfarm.com use the code natural for a 20 percent discount that's stonecityfarm.com code natural for 20 percent off your order you never know what could be hiding in your soap so you love talk radio then you'll love talkstreamlive.com talkstream live is always on 24 7 with the best streaming talk shows find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones it's free readily available online or on the smartphone or tablet finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier just go to talkstreamlive.com be sure to download the free apps from google play or the itunes app store Would you like relief from muscle pain, headaches, and discomfort to sleep better, have more energy during the day, and just feel naturally amazing? Fibromalic can help. Its blend of malic acid and magnesium can provide pain relief and comfort for those who experience fibromyalgia. It helps your body absorb more oxygen, and it works quickly for a significant reduction in pain within 48 hours, all without a prescription. Ask for Fibromalic at health and vitamin shops or shop Fibromalic.com. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi available, you can still listen to every minute of Fade to Black by just calling 605-562-4482. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan and no extra cost if you have unlimited minutes. Just call 605-562-4482. You can listen to me, Jimmy Church, on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Go back, Lee Tappy. secret i love ponies i really love ponies i'm serious i couldn't stay sane without ponies to brush why fade to black because you never got that pony damn it this is fade to black with jimmy church on the game changer radio network and kgra the global radio alliance Welcome back, Fade to Black, 20th anniversary of the Phoenix Lights. Our guest tonight, Dr. Lynn Katai. And what's really funny here, I'm looking at uh, some of the quotes from uh, Governor Fife Symington III, and one of them is, I'm a pilot and I know just about every machine that flies. It was bigger than anything I've ever seen. It remains a great mystery. Other people saw it, responsible people. I don't know why people would ridicule it. But certainly he did, didn't he? You know, and he backpedal. Didn't his son also witness it with him? Um, I'm really not sure about that. In fact, his son met with one of our um, cast members from the documentary. You asked me if, you know, if I had seen him or talked with him. Right. And uh, took him the book and the documentary and never heard a word. I have not heard a word all these years. Um, I have tried to contact him just to thank him for coming forward because it really did uh, move the investigation a giant step forward to have an elected official admit that he saw saw it uh, publicly, um, but uh, we have never met. 
Yeah, he says here it was enormous and inexplicable. Who knows where it came from? A lot of people saw it, and I saw it too. It was dramatic, and it couldn't have been flares because it was too symmetrical. There you go. Another quote from Fife Symington the Third. Okay, now let me ask you this. I remember seeing uh, a documentary about the lining up of of Camelback with uh, with the lights and and how uh, it, it must have been flares and and okay. uh, I, I'm confused how that was it, such a thorn. Right, right. Because <laughs> people on so the long. yeah people oh. on the ground are seeing one thing. And then this came out. Is that just, you know, someone just well, trying that, to debunk it? That was such, uh, you know, if, you, if again, I, I go into this in the book. If you really see how the story progressed, you see how inane that was. Because um, as, it, as it turned out, uh, I had such a, a plethora of documentation on film that could not be explained that, we uh, got the message that someone was coming into town to do a uh, uh, a, 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 a show um, called Anatomy of a Sighting. It was supposed to be very incredibly done and professionally done. And I thought, you know what, it's about time that people learn the fact that this is not only March 13th. This was happening for months, if not years before or centuries before, and it's happening worldwide. I didn't know about it as a medical doctor. I'm sure there were people out there that also didn't know this information. And I met with the producer, and I showed him my pictures, which he just blew off. He didn't even look at them. And he said, well, the military said they were flares, which sent up a red flag immediately. And I said I would do a um, uh, shaded, uh, anonymous interview if I could share the fact that this was happening uh, worldwide, and uh, that it was happening before March 13th. There's a lot more to this story. And the director, once I sat down, just pummeled me with questions about March 13th, and I thought, geez, what is he going to use from from my, my uh, interview, which was really scant as far as March 13th, because I really wanted to focus on the rest of the story. And as it was, they, uh, I ended up on the cutting room floor, which was just fine for me, but what they did was supposedly, okay, take the Kristen Boomerang video and show that it went behind the mountains. So therefore, their conclusion, because it went behind the mountains, it was flares from the um, Barry Goldwater firing range that was south. Um, We're talking 90 miles south, okay? Right. Well, number one, uh, you know, I not only spoke with the air traffic controllers two months before, and they actually watched the true unknown turn against the wind as a unit, elevate and go behind South Mountain in January. So just because it went behind South Mountain doesn't mean that it flares. That's number one. Number two, which is really interesting, is that there is not no documentation for that. In fact, just recently... Um, there are retired military that have come out to say that it never happened, that there were no flares sent off. Now, even if there were, I mean, you know, let's just say that they were as a, a diversion. Um, it, as far as that report goes, they played that report, so that program, so many times. And by the way, I called the producer afterwards to find out how they analyzed the Kristen video because I wanted them to analyze my, my data. And he said, well, we really didn't analyze it. We just put a daylight uh, picture up with the, um, with the video and uh, saw that it went behind the mountain, so it, it had to be flares. And it was like, what? I mean, it just, it just didn't compute. So, you know, we leave that open-ended. <laughs> I said to him, well, you know, I'd love you to analyze my data. He said, well, you know, if we get funding for that, I'll let you know. So I wondered who had funded this program. Okay. But be that as it may. It was such a thorn in the side because they showed it so many times. They right. showed it a prime time and Thanksgiving and Christmas. And I mean, it was just like, was ad nauseum. And when people would see that over and over again, I even had relatives from back east call me and say, oh, we just saw that program and they showed that it was flares. I mean, it just really, you know, what can I tell you? We're, we're learning about fake news now. <laughs> so, 
you know, you just have to take it for what it is. And, and what's really interesting is there was a reporter from one of the stations here who actually saw one of the crafts, and he was trying to get to the bottom of it. And he met with my Kristen, and they showed in a report, okay, and we have that in the, uh, in the bonus features of our documentary, that the video was altered to conform with the mountain range in that program. I saw... There's, and, I, and, and you can see it for quite clearly, by the right. way. That's not just hearsay. There's one lone light that is separate from the string of lights that's on the right side of a tree on the Kristen property. In the program's video, that one lone light, it's like whoever did this knew that they were going to pull this, that one lone light was on the other side of the tree in the program. So the video was blatantly altered. I saw a video, uh, and I watched it many times. It was somebody off of the 10 freeway in between Phoenix and Tucson shoots this video of the V-shaped craft, and it was uh, the seven lights, perfect V, right, boomerang, moving across the sky, blocking out the stars. You can see the stars moving in the background. And uh, and and there it is, and it lasted for about uh, it was a few minutes for sure. And I watched that video for a couple of months online, and then the specific site where it was at anyway, it disappeared. The website disappeared. The video is nowhere to be seen now. It's nowhere on on the net. And it was one of the most crazy, out, out of all the UFO videos I've ever seen or you or you know, uh, we've all seen, it was incredible. And now that, that video is apparently gone and missing. What do you think about that? And have you seen the video I'm talking about? Um, I've seen video, uh, a couple of videos. In fact, a year after the mass sighting, there was another uh, big sighting here. And it was right after a weekend um, that was extremely foggy, and we don't have fog. <laughs> it's a rarity, needless to say, because our humidity is usually 10. And uh, it was really eerie. I mean, we could not see beyond our street, and even my husband joked that they could be watching. Um, and uh, a couple days later, and it was still really foggy, uh, these lights started appearing, uh, at a distance again, and but they were muted, and I didn't want to get everybody all excited. And I had met with the University of Arizona um, to, to analyze my data. The, uh, the head of the optical the science department was very interested, and uh, he, I was just using this really, you know, inexpensive Canon Instamatic. I can't believe the wonderful pictures that I actually caught of the close sighting and so forth with it. But he said if they come back, and this was in '98. January of 98, um, I should get uh, better equipment. So the next morning I called them up and they told me what to get with, and I ended up getting a top-of-the-line Pentex camera and a telelens and a star filter. And I didn't want to get everybody excited yet, um, but that night there was an, uh, another sighting that was really amazing. And if you go on the Phoenix Lights Network photo page, Phoenix Lights Network website photo page, you'll see um, two orbs in the same exact location again, where South Mountain and the Australias intersect, and the Gila uh, Native Americans think there's a gateway or portal there. And there's another gigantic, gigantic um, craft or something. And anyway, the next morning I told uh, Village Labs to alert the other videographers from the mass sighting night. And interestingly, we had people located north, south, east, and west, and we all caught on video a 40-mile-wide, 20-minute array of straight lines and mirror images. And like you're saying, we had triangles out in um, Buckeye that appeared and then disappeared, and then they appeared again in the same spot, and then they would disappear, and then they would appear again at the same spot. I mean, we, it was incredible, incredible footage that the very next morning, um, Extra actually grabbed some of my footage that was spectacular and, and showed it, and it was on hard copy. I mean, there's, you know, there's some great footage out there. <laughs> and I wish we had some more footage of the, of the Phoenix Lights, and I know that there's a number of people that have told me that they did take footage 
of the craft. And one thing or another happened, the, the uh, video, you know, somebody uh, recorded over the video or got lost or whatever. Um, if anybody's listening and they do have any video or pictures, we certainly welcome them even 20, 20 years later, for sure. Sure, sure. Um, Eric just, uh, uh, he wanted me to ask you, uh, at the UFO Congress recently, did you meet the mother and daughter who spoke about their 1997 experience? Yes, yes, I have. I have talked to them, and I actually um, there. There's so many wonderful witnesses. I mean, that that's the thing. Like I mentioned, once the media, uh, you know, started talking to the witnesses, their their descriptions were so heartfelt and so detailed. Um, you know, it's. I mean, they saw something that was incredible, and it's affected them at a very deep level to this day. And that doesn't happen with balloons and helicopters and holograms or whatever they've come up with or flare certainly um so something really profound and unusual happened and and they spoke um very articulately about their experience and it was uh you know it's exciting to hear when when people describe what they saw and it and it just affects people at a very very deep level there's something going on to to wake people up and that's you know people ask me all the time what was the phoenix lights about well besides the fact that they wanted to be seen in a very gentle, non-threatening way to alert us to their presence. And, you know, besides that, they, they really, you know, affected people at a deep level, and we haven't seen anything closely, remotely. I mean, don't you think if we had this technology, if we had it, and, and I don't know what they are, I just know that they are, and I, they could be, um, you know, interdimensional for sure, I have to say, because I saw it up close and personal, and I can get into that close sighting and the analysis that Dr. Bruce McAbee did and presented the case at the uh, 1999 MUFON International Symposium, um, and his conclusion was quite riveting. Um, but anyway, uh, you know, I mean, this, the, the technology itself was so out of the realm of anything that we have, if, if we did have this technology, don't you think we'd be using it <laughs> with everything that's going on in the Middle East and so forth? Um, but if, if you, do you want me to get into the close sighting? Well, we, yes, and uh, uh, right now, uh, let's do that. I do have this question. This came in from Rick, and he wanted me to ask you about the family in Phoenix that heard the craft project, don't worry, this is just a test. Oh, you know, it's very interesting. We we have a uh, not only description by a psychiatrist and his family coming up from, uh, and there were a number of people who had this experience, and even the fellow who just emailed me today had the experience um, that uh, they were coming up from Phoenix to, uh, I mean, from Tucson to Phoenix for a swim meet, and uh, and as they were coming up, they see this gigantic uh, craft. That, that covered their car. They, they, I mean, for minutes, it was uh, like 10 minutes or more, and I, I described, the, he described the whole thing, uh, and I actually um, put it in the book if people want to read it. It was really, really interesting, but nobody said anything to anybody <laughs> until months later. Months later, they saw it on TV, and they looked at each other, and it was like, we saw that. And the wife said that she had gotten uh, telepathic messages not to worry. This wasn't to harm them. And um, I'm trying to find, actually, the, the letter that the guy sent me today because he said the same thing. That's, that, that's very interesting. And, and now let's get to Bruce McAbee and his analysis and your close-up sightings of, from the house. Did you have anything telepathic? Did anything hit you with, don't worry, this is just well, that's how, if we, if we go back to the close sighting, when I said, you know, that it might be interdimensional, interstellar, it could be time travelers, they could be here. I mean, we certainly have 70% of the world is ocean, and they could very well be, right, right. Uh, you know, uh, living there for centuries, who knows. But um, the close sighting, again, my husband and I had no interest or knowledge in this topic at all. And one wall of our bedroom is a window, so whatever pops up out there, and we were pretty high on the mountain, so we have a panoramic view of the city skyline, and we know what helicopters and street lights and car lights and all look like. And, you know, if there's a fire out there or a haboob, you know, a dust storm coming across, we get to see it, and we get to see the planes coming in and out of Sky Harbor. 
And actually, it was that's another little coincidence. It was the night before my birthday, and uh, and I was taking a leisurely bath, and uh, my husband was in the bedroom, uh, standing by the window, talking to my mother-in-law, uh, who had called to wish me happy birthday from back east. And suddenly, he said, "And you have to know my husband. I mean, he's on several was on several hospital and medical boards, and nothing ever." Uh, ruffled his feathers, uh, but he sounded alarmed. He says, get over here quick, what the hell is this? And I grabbed the towel and ran over to the window, and here right b- below us, actually, over a very treacherous uh, desert landscape, um, and we live in a, a gated community, there were three oval uh, orbs, three orbs in a pyramid formation, one on top and two closely aligned, about... 50, 75 feet off the ground, less than 100 yards from our property. And I'm looking at this and thinking, oh, my goodness, I want to get my video camera. But, and you'll hear this from people, and you've had sightings, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Over and over again, you don't move. You're just in awe. You don't know how long it's going to last. And I tried to take everything in mentally, the size, the shape, the color. They were about three to six feet each, depending on how close they were. They were oval shape, like an egg on its side. And there were three distinct objects very closely aligned. And I called them an orb because the light did not extend outside the edge. It was very self-contained, and it was a uniform amber color throughout, very soft, very mesmerizing. And I noticed immediately every other light out there glared, every other light. These did not glare. They were very, very mesmerizing. And I thought, if I don't get a picture of this, nobody's going to believe it. And I keep a 35-millimeter camera in the closet for our beautiful sunsets. I collect sunsets, and I go to grab it, and my husband calls me back. He says, get over here quick. One of them is disappearing. And as we stood there in utter awe, the top orb, excuse me, the top orb without budging, and I really took note of this, started to, it's hard to explain, it started to implode, like, like shrink mechanically, like very, very slowly, as if it was cloaking and just getting smaller and smaller and smaller until it was a pea size. And even after it disappeared, it felt like it was still there. And I immediately jumped out on the balcony, got a quick picture of the two lower oars, which are on the photo page, if anybody wants to take a look at that on the Phoenix Lights Network website, and noticed an eerie silence as if time had stopped. It was just bizarre to me. As intently as I was watching these two lower orbs, and I didn't admit this to anyone for two, over two years till the mass sighting, after the mass sighting, it felt like something was watching me as intently as I was watching these orbs and going through my mind, and this is exactly what I was thinking, who are you, what are you, do you know that I'm here, I'd love to meet you. And the next thing I know, and I realize that the left bottom orb is starting to shrink, very, very slowly, and something told me to take a picture, and I clicked a quick picture. That was the only one that turned out at the time. But for me, and I caught this in action, for me it was confirmation that something really unusual happened. It was close. I didn't even know who to show them to. I didn't even know where to go with the pictures and wondered for two years what this advanced technology was doing right outside our bedroom window until they started appearing again at a distance. Anyway, after that 98 sighting. I'm looking at, I want everybody to, I'm looking at the picture now. And it's right there. Just go to the photos page at uh, thephoenixlights.net. And you can scroll through and, and look at the image that she's referring to. I want to be clear about what I'm looking at. Are you saying from your house you were actually because i see the other so you're looking down i see phoenix right. in the background it was, down. it was a little below us that this is this is insane this is insane but there it gets better <laughs> how, how can it get better wait a minute wait a minute, wait a minute. did they so, deliver a pizza i mean how does it get wait. better i mean <laughs> that would have been cool <laughs> wait wait a minute wait a minute okay okay so do we have a, a yeah, we, few we minutes got, so yeah. I can finish this? Yep. Okay. So, so anyway, after the 98 sighting, and I didn't do anything with those other pictures, by the way. I mean, eventually I had them analyzed by Jim Dalatoso, and then, then I had them analyzed by Brooks Institute of Photography and University of Arizona and so forth. But after the 98 sighting, 
we finally had four from north, south, east, and west, four witnesses that had captured the same exact sighting on video. Because if you, if, if you go back to March 13th and you look at the fact that myself and Steve Blonder, who had called MUFON up to his balcony on March 13th, because he was seeing them for days before as I was, and he wanted them to see what he was seeing, right. and they caught an arrowhead of five lights. And if you just look at that footage, my goodness, those lights are either attached to something or have a force field holding them in rock-solid formation. We took our video before 10 o'clock, and the boomerangs were after 10 o'clock. And I actually had procured a geology professor from ASU to try to triangulate those videos to see where the phenomena were located. And once he realized that we took not only different formations, okay, which were reflective of what other people were seeing, the triangle, the, uh, the arrowhead, the V, the boomerang, but it was at different times, and he just he gave up. He said, there's no way I can triangulate this. But here in 98, we had four videos at the same exact time that could be analyzed. So I had been told by, actually, I had met with uh, Linda Moulton Howe. Very few people knew what I had, but I had, I had met with Linda Moulton Howe, and she had recommended that I get in touch with Dr. Bruce McAbee, Navy optical physicist, very well respected in the field, which I did to take a look at the videos. And as an afterthought, I put the first and the last picture, the ones that are on the uh, website, mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in the package, and I said, please tell me what we were looking at <laughs> in 95. He gets in touch a couple weeks later. He said, Dr. Lynn, you told me that um, the sighting that you had in 95 was only a couple minutes. I said, right. He said, are you sure? I said, well, that's what I remember. And what I shared with you, by the way, is what I remember. I don't remember the third light going out. I don't remember coming in that night or going to bed. I don't remember. But anyway, he said, look at the pictures. Now, you're looking at the pictures, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, he says, first of all, and he was analyzing my other pictures, too, the same exact phenomena, the line phenomena that I would capture two months before the mass sighting and during the mass sighting was in the same exact location then, too, in those pictures in 95, disappearing as the close orbs were disappearing. Do you see that? In the yep. first picture, there's four, yep. and in the distance, in the, second, in the last picture, there's two. But he said even more significant, he said, look at the skyline. And I would have never noticed this in a million years. He meticulously saw that, and his study is not only on our website, but, it, but I, I finally shared it after 12 years of keeping it private in the uh, 2010 uh, version of the book. He said, look at the skyline. There are many lights, groups of lights, that are on in the first picture that are off in the last picture. He said, that doesn't happen in a couple of minutes. He said, I want you to do an experiment. He said, go out on the balcony, stand approximately the same spot you were standing in 95, and keep in mind, this is three years later, and take a picture of the skyline one night every 15 minutes, one night every half hour, or one night every hour, and we'll see when those lights start going out. Well, I usually take a bath between 7 and 8 when I'm home, so let's be conservative and start out at 8 p.m. The first groups of lights start going out at 9 the last picture is indicative of 10:30, 11 o'clock at night. So he says to me, and I couldn't make, you know, I, mean, I, I, it was, I was oblivious to all this at the time. He says, do you mind if I present this case at the upcoming 1999 MUFON International Symposium in Washington, D.C.? I said, hey, this is your baby. I would have never noticed this data. Just keep my name out of it, and please keep me anonymous. Which okay, I well, let's, we have really to take, well, let's take a break right there, and we'll pick up. That's a, I can only cut it so close here. So let's, no, that's and, okay, and, because and, what he came up with, you'll be amazed. And, and we'll do that right after this short break. Our guest tonight, Dr. Lynn Katai, the 20th anniversary of the Phoenix Lights. I'm looking at the pictures now. Just go to thephoenixlights.net. Click on photos, and you can follow right through with everything that we're talking about right now. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. More with Dr. Lincoln Ty right after this short break. Stay with us. Vivica Fox here, and 
you are listening to my boy, Jimmy Church, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Despite popular opinion, reading a book will not make you smarter. But listening to Jimmy Church will. Balance of Nature's Fruits and Veggies. I had gout in both my knees, and it's gone. Uh, well, I'm pretty stupid. I should have ordered it, like, you know, 15 years ago. Best really? thing I ever got in my... It's, it's the most effective product that I've ever bought in my life. He had eczema on his hand, and it cracked and it cracked for years. Mm-hmm. He did anything from doctor, every cream, everything. And three months on the veggies and fruit, mm-hmm. it was gone. They're just awesome. They keep asking me, what am I doing? I told them what I did with my cholesterol. I had the blood test, right? And it went down 100 points. 262, now it's 162. Everything is just perfect. Call now to find out how to get your free month supply of Balance of Nature. Call 800-2468-751. That's 800-2468-751. Call now, 800-2468-751. Or go online to balanceofnature.com. Use promo code TSL. Would odors, mold, and mildew describe your basement or crawl space? It doesn't have to be that way. Transform them into a fresh, healthy, usable one with the technologically advanced Wave Moisture Control Units. The computerized operation maximizes moisture control and also expels harmful radon, combustion gases, and numerous other pollutants. Dehumidifiers are old technology that do nothing for air quality and waste energy. Wave units are intelligent, self-monitoring, do not need maintenance, and will save you hundreds in electricity. Wave units are still running effectively effectively over 15 years. They've been tested and installed in public and military housing and by property managers nationwide. Buy a unit now and if your home is not fresher and drier, you can return it for a full refund for up to 12 months. What have you got to lose? Call now. 1-888-618-WAVE. 1-888-618-WAVE. Or visit mydryhome.com. That's mydryhome.com. Wave Home Solutions for a healthy, comfortable home. What's up, Fade or Nots? Studio Dumb loves Fade to Black and the F2B audience so much that they have put together the ultimate stereo Bluetooth system. They've done it just for you. Man, check this out. The Studio Dome SBB2 stereo system is here. It's featuring two Studio Boombox 2 SBB2 wireless Bluetooth speakers packed in its own custom hard shell case. This Studio Dome system features the very latest in stereo Bluetooth technology. The two full-range boomboxes are in true wireless stereo. You've got to hear this. It's amazing. It's just $129, and use the promo code JCRTWS, and you'll also get free shipping. It's simple. Just go to JimmyChurchRadio.com, click on the Studio Dome banner. Go back, Lee Tappy. It's not a lifestyle we chose. We were born this way. KGRARadio.com This is KJCR at JimmyChurchRadio.com All right, welcome back. The 20th anniversary of the Phoenix Lights. Our guest tonight, Dr. Lin Katai. I want to remind everybody, in the membership area, we are giving away a Tascam DR100 Mark III this month. Just go to the membership area, get a one-year subscription. Your name will go in the hat. We'll do the drawing live in just two weeks. I'm excited. It is one of the great devices to use for not only ghost hunting, but if you're a musician, it is uh, one of the great professional digital recorders out there giving one away this month. All right, Dr. Katai. So Bruce Maccabee does this analysis. There's one thing, one comment that I have is in your series of photographs here, you have one that's a daylight shot that shows South Mountain. Clearly, these lights are appearing not only above South Mountain, but right above the airport, too, as well. I mean, it is a crazy thing 
to to have the lights where they are positioned and you can tell well to my eyes that they're in between the mountain and where you are but uh, but over the city uh yeah i mean i you know they're they're all over arizona <laughs> and, and if you notice the sunset pictures there in two different months in november and december in 2000 and i did not see this when i was taking the pictures uh, but I mentioned I, I collect sunsets. When I got five rolls of film back after the holidays, lo and behold, I see that there's this giant rod in the same exact location a month apart. Yeah, it's huge, too. You see that? Yes. And oh, I did yeah. not see it when I was taking the pictures, by yeah, the way. Yeah, both of these uh, photographs are pretty incredible. With the, with the I don't know what that... That is an interdimensional life force, whatever that is. That what, is a, whatever it is, what it is. Right. That, that's why I had to come forward, Jimmy. I mean, I have this incredible data, and people can decide for themselves. But anyway, Dr. Bruce McAbee went to um, uh, Washington D.C. to move on International Symposium in 1999, and he presented the close sighting case as the first authenticated, and as far as we know, the only authenticated photographic evidence of missing time. Now, that's pretty heavy. You asked me if I ever got any messages. Right. Um, certainly, as I mentioned earlier, the Native cultures believe that these orbs, for one, are giving them knowledge and uh, comfort and inspiration, and for whatever reason, I have certainly been inspired to do what I'm doing the last 20 years. But even even more than that, and the reason that I finally decided to share it, was that quantum physics and quantum mechanics is starting to catch up a little bit with their theories of bubble theories and string theories. There may be 10 or 11 different dimensions out there along with ours. Well, if there's other times and spaces along with ours, then why is it such a leap to think that there might be other intelligences, maybe even sentient intelligences, out there in those other times and spaces that we get glimpses of if we're open to them or invited. That's right. So, you know, that's that that's number one. Number two, I did find, and I think you'll find this interesting in your listeners as well, this email that I just got today, there are no coincidences, um, from this fella who sees this thing coming towards him. And let me let me read this to you because it really is quite quite poignant. Um, he says, um, okay, here we go. A voice appeared in my head. It sounded like a hundred soothing voices softly speaking simultaneously. Do not worry. We are merely searching. As I stood transfixed in awe, I managed to raise my left hand in a sort of star-struck, dumbfounded half-wave. I managed to reply one word, hi. As the vessel passed overhead, I could feel its sheer mass. However, it made no sound. I felt like I was in a giant magnet or something. The ship was black like onyx and shaped like a pyramid with a triangle cut out of the center in the cutout portion of the ship. And we hear this from a lot of witnesses, by the way. The stars in view beyond the ship contorted like looking through a thin sheet of water or heat waves on concrete. I didn't speak of this for 17 years or even remember it really. He was 16 years old. Until three years ago, I stumbled across a picture of the Phoenix Lights in some TV show. I felt like I had been hit by a train as memories came flooding back. I have told three people now, but never in detail. I always felt awkward that this is the first time I have ever tried to recall in detail. And he goes on more if people want to read it because he gave us permission to post it on our share page, which I also uh, welcome other people to to, uh, email me if they want to give me a detailed uh, report of of their sightings, just so other people know that they're not alone. Wow, I'm looking at the share page now. This is awesome. Oh, it's, 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 but we have thousands more. I'm <laughs> looking, I'm just, I'm scrolling through. This is, uh, this is pretty amazing. Wow. And I have military there and pilots that have contacted me and 
Uh, you know, and I, I take confidentiality very seriously, by the way, for anybody that's listening. So if you don't want it up there, that's fine. If you just want anonymous or your initials, that's fine, too. Um, so people can hear the truth from, from other witnesses. What's going to go on? Uh, obviously, the, the, the day is Monday. What's going on for activities for you throughout the weekend? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> As I mentioned earlier, the, the media has been so welcoming, and, and they take it seriously. I mean, this is a model for what should happen everywhere. Um, yes, there's, there have been sightings that have been easily explained as weather balloons or blimps or whatever, but they take it seriously. There's no more stickering, no more laughing or discrediting uh, of the messenger or the data here in, in uh, Phoenix. Um, they take it seriously. It's really a big deal here uh, every year. And, and I try to keep it alive myself. I host this um, big event at the Scottsdale Hark and Shea Theater, and uh, we show the documentary on the big screen, which is very exciting. And um, that's went over a dozen international film festival awards. We're so proud. It's very unusual for a documentary, especially one of this genre. And it really, it's, it's one of the only mainstream that I know of uh, events. Ninety uh, percent of the audience are just regular people that either saw it or know somebody that did or just curious. Um, and it really they come as strangers and leave connected. Because once they see the documentary, and I hope people will uh, take a peek at that because we've worked very hard to, to get something out there that's a gentle introduction uh, to the topic and, uh, and kind of an overview of the topic, certainly based on the, on the Phoenix Lights. But uh, afterwards, we have um, wonderful speakers and uh, a Q&A, and we really get into it. Nobody wants to leave. <laughs> they literally throw us out of the theater at 5 o'clock. It starts at 1 o'clock. So anybody that's in the neighborhood on, on Sunday at the Scottsdale Hark and Shea Theater, please get your tickets early. It's sold out every year for the last 12 years since the world premiere in 2005. And, uh, and it's just a fun, fun experience. Um, also, uh, you know, I'm going to be uh, interviewed. Uh, I just did some interviews today that are going to be aired tomorrow morning and live tomorrow morning. And uh, on on uh, CNN and ABC here, and then filming for NBC, and it's a big deal. And then uh, uh, tomorrow night on Fox, if anybody's in the neighborhood, the 9 o'clock uh, Fox program, they've really been supportive of, of everything we're doing. And um, So we have a lot of media stuff going on and uh, this big event on Sunday. And, of course, I just came out with my... My book, the third edition of the book, The Phoenix Lights, A Skeptic's Discovery, That We Are Not Alone. And, you know, I have to say, I mean, if somebody shows me what they are, if I see it up close and personal again, and there's an explanation, okay, um, I'm open to it. But it's 20 years later, and nothing has come close to explaining what we saw on March 13, 1997. And we've updated the documentary as well, and we just... Uh, and with the with the book, the Kindle version just went on today, and it is amazing because it's the first time that you can really see the colored pictures and the links uh, that I've accumulated through the years that are very informative, are are live, and oh, I th uh, yeah, we lost you for a second. You there? Yeah, I'm here. You hear that? Yeah that that was bizarre. Something else going on there. Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, I got you. Yeah, that's uh, that was that was pretty bizarre. You dropped out for a second, and I heard something interfere. Wow, that was weird. That was weird. Okay. Yeah. You're talking about the Kindle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Who else is uh, who's going to speak on Sunday? We have um, our our former vice mayor and councilwoman Frances Barwood, and I didn't even get into her story. She was amazing. I mean, she. She really, to me, is a glowing star of the, of the Phoenix Lights because she was the only person, uh, innocently, she didn't see it, but so many of her constituents were calling her and asking her why there isn't an investigation that in May, okay, this is several months later, she innocently asked for an investigation and was plastered by the media. I mean, it was really... Yeah, she was pretty angry. ...to see what happened. What's that? She was pretty angry. Well, she, she really just wanted to get down to the bottom of it, and, uh, you know, she was harassed by the media, uh, especially the print media. 
Um, and, you know, jokes were made of her, little jokes and stuff. And um, But she didn't let down. She did not let down. I mean, she she's going to be speaking on Sunday and telling us some little inside stuff. I mean, she even sent a letter to McCain, um, who was a senator at the time and, you know, was thinking about running for president. And uh, he sent the letter off to the National Archives, which uh, is really just, you know, it just sits there. Um, nothing really happens to it. So she was pretty angry about that, <laughs> to tell you the truth. And, uh, you know, she's going to talk about some of the inside stuff that happened with her. Um, and then we have the Arizona Navajo Rangers, um, who it's very exciting that we have law enforcement that are taking these anomalies seriously, and there's a lot going on uh, up at the Navajo Range, and they'll talk about that. And we have a Zuni old elder who talks about the Native American uh, connection. And last year I was uh, contacted by one of the top physicists and UFO experts from China. He was coming in to visit his son who had just moved here uh, and had heard about the Phoenix Lights and my data, and we sat and had this whole briefing um, that uh, I believe was televised actually in China. And um, it was translated by his son. and. He was blown away by the 35 millimeter photographs I had and showed me right there f- photographs that were identical um, that are happening in China. And he's going to be talking about that and showing some of his data. And then we have a Q&A, which is always exciting. And, and we have uh, the cast members coming and a book signing. So it's really going to be a, a fun, fun, fun day. And again, the, the Kindle version just went up today of the book, of the 2017 version. Uh, of the book, with uh, we keep updating it. It keeps evolving. There's new things that happen every year, and uh, and it's only 9.99. So get it while you can, because um, the price will be going up after the anniversary. And uh, I, I welcome people to take a look at it, and it's terrific with with colored pictures and links to wonderful, wonderful uh, websites. So. Um, there's a lot going on, and of course, the website itself is is loaded with information. Yes, Jimmy. Absolutely. Dr. Linkatai, thank you so much. Very exciting times, and I, I just can't believe it's been 20 years. But we will, one day, I'm, I'm serious, one day we'll find out exactly who they were, right? And, <laughs> and, and you're right there. Thank you so much, Dr. Lin. You are the very oh, best. Thank you. Thank you for letting me share, and everybody just keep looking up. Thank you so much, Dr. Linkatai. And also, I want to remind everybody, thephoenixlights.net. Now, if you go to jimmychurchradio.com, just click on the link right there. It's that simple. Get to it. Bookmark it. Go to the photo section. I, I just reviewed the share page that she was referring to. And that letter that she was just reading from is posted there. And you can check that out, too, as well. The phoenixlights.net. Again, the, the celebration is going on uh, Sunday in Phoenix. And all of the information is over on her website, Dr. Lynn Katai. The very best. Thank you so much. Now, um, before I move on, um, I'm looking at some of the comments here in Twitter, and I think all of you guys get it. And I want to drive something home. Uh, You know, I know Dr. Lynn, and um, when you... When you talk to her and you you meet her in person and you talk to her, yes, she's an MD. Yes, she's a doctor. Yeah, she did not have to go down this road. She, she, you know, life was good, right? You don't need to go down this road. And when something like this happens and you look at these, uh, the egg orb photographs and, and this stuff is going on outside of her home and she's photo and, and then the Phoenix lights happen. You know, for her to give all of that up for us, she deserves a medal. She's one of the brightest people that I know. And just go and look and and get the book and and watch the documentary. I have the documentary here. It's absolutely incredible. And uh, her information and, and and the the vibe that I get, you know, I'm just thankful that she has decided to go from. Uh, she, she said it well, right? Anonymity to go from that to out into the public like this when she didn't have to, she did that for us. And we need to thank her for that. Thank you, Dr. Linkatai. Amazing. All right. Now on almost the same note, 
check this out. I have to share this with you. No one knows for certain why the Clovis people and other uh, iconic beasts like the Mastodon and the Mammoth and the Sabertooth Tiger that were living some 12,800 years ago suddenly disappeared. Well, a discovery of widespread platinum at archaeological sites across the United States by three University of South Carolina archaeologists has provided an important clue in solving this enduring mystery. Now listen to this. The study authored by 10 researchers, builds on similar findings of platinum, an element associated with cosmic objects like asteroids or comets, found by Harvard University researchers in an ice core from Greenland back in 2013. Now, the South Carolina researchers found an abundance of platinum in soil layers that coincided with the Younger Dryas, that climatic period of extreme cooling that began around 12,800 years ago and lasted for about 1,400 years. The presence of platinum was found in the soil layers at 11 archaeological sites in California, Arizona, New Mexico, Ohio, Virginia, North Carolina, and South Carolina. And it shows that a cosmic imp impact event occurred. Now, think about that for a second. We have talked about all of this going on around the world. When I say things are connected, think about this for a second. And what we're dealing with, Gobekli Tepe and the timing of that, right? The last modern ice age, this impact event that happened and the, the platinum that is in a line, when you see the marks um, uh, on, on the map uh, in, in a line across the United States, it, sign it signifies that this event did actually happen. Right. Think about that for a second. And and it actually went down. Everything is connected. Now, also, this happened last week. I didn't get a chance to get to this, uh, but Amazon dot com has now blamed human error for the outage at its cloud services unit that caused widespread disruption to the Internet traffic across the United States earlier last week. In a post on its website, Amazon said that the outage started with a typo. A typo at Amazon's North Virginia data centers last Tuesday. <clears throat> Listen to me. An employee trying to speed up the company's S3 cloud storage billing system Try to take a few servers offline. The employee mistyped the command, however, affecting more servers than intended, which led to a cascade of failures that ultimately knocked out S3 and other Amazon services. Took longer than expected, of course, to restart those services. Amazon Web Services is the largest global seller of cloud infrastructure with more than a million users. 54 of the Internet's top 100 retailers saw web performance drop and slow by as much as 20% or more. <laughs> A typo. You got to love it. Now, amid of all the lured sales on the dark web, one auction could be of interest to as many as a million people. Why? Because you're probably on this list. A seller hopes to profit off of 1 million Gmail and Yahoo accounts with decrypted emails, usernames, and passwords that were leaked in various hacks. 1 million accounts could be compromised and for sale on the dark web. A user called SunZoo583 is auctioning off 500,000 Gmail accounts. Are you ready? for just $28.24, and that's in one auction, and another 450000 in another for $25.74. Gmail's reputation for being one of the most secure providers is still largely intact, as the accounts involved in the auctions largely seem to have been hacked through third parties, such as the Bitcoin security forum, Tumblr, Last.fm, uh, Adobe Dropbox, Flash, Flash, Revolution, Lookbook, and via the Xbox 360. Now, Sun Tzu 583 is also selling 100,000 Yahoo accounts. Are you ready? For $10.75. Because the information was obtained back in 2012. Now, last month, Yahoo started notifying people that it discovered yet another account breach. 
apparently a forged cookie attack had been used to access a new set of accounts over the past two years. At the time, it wasn't known how many accounts had been accessed, but now we know it's in the millions once again. Remember, Yahoo already admitted to over a billion accounts were compromised in August of 2013. That was followed by a further 500 million accounts being accessed in 2014. This latest breach is, relatively speaking, quite small, with only 32 million accounts. This is insane. Yahoo believes these new accounts were accessed by the same state-sponsored actor responsible for the 2014 breach. That's key here. State sponsored. The proprietary code running Yahoo's system was accessed as to learn how to forge cookies. Those unauthorized cookies were then used to access user accounts. The cookies have since been invalidated to block further access, and all effective users should have been contacted by Yahoo regarding how to re-secure their accounts. As to why the hackers take the time to breach Yahoo servers and access accounts, well, it turns out that the data is worth something. In August of last year, it was revealed that some of the stolen Yahoo data was available for sale on the dark web for $300,000. CEO Marissa Meyer won't be receiving a cash bonus for 2016 because of all of this. And they may actually take away her 2017 annual bonus. Meanwhile, Verizon lowered the price it was willing to pay for Yahoo's core assets by $350 million down to $4.48 billion. Could it even fall further now? Probably. I told you before, and I really mean this, and I'm, I'm just turning out I've been 100% completely right on all of this. It's not worth much. Yahoo right now, they're still ranked, you know, number six, number seven in the world uh, by Alexa. They have a lot of traffic. I get all of that. But it's like one of the most unsecure places to go, certainly with Yahoo email. Their accounts are shrinking. I would offer them nothing. All right, uh, we are out of here. I'm out of time. So let's go ahead and thank Dr. Lynn Katai one more time. Just go to jimmychurchradio.com, click on her link, thephoenixlights.net, the 20th anniversary of the Phoenix Lights. Can you believe it? I want to thank her for one of the best conversations I've had on this show in a long time, and also John Rappaport and his No More Fake Newsroom. Fade to Black's executive producer is Rita Kamarian. Show is produced by Hilton J. Paul, Mark D. Kovar, LJ3, Renee Jonas. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Bob. Announcers are Steve Harder, Gene Vito, and Mark D. Kovar. Fady by Dale. Webmaster is Drew the Geek. Music, Doug Aldrich. Intro, Space Boy. Spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network. Syndication is KGRA The Planet. Thank you, John Rappaport. Thank you, Dr. Link Katai. This broadcast is owned and copyrighted 2017 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black or the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Follow me on Twitter at JChurchRadio. Everybody have a great weekend. Go Beckley Tappy.